good evening. Thank you. Welcome to the NYU School of Engineering, Tandem School of Engineering, in the wonderful borough of Brooklyn. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, one and all. Please hand, please say hello. Raise your hand. Thank you. I'm Senator Montgomery, and this particular school is in my district, but we have a number of elected officials here, all of us here, to listen to you. But before we start the formal official program, I have one small thing that I would like to do, if you would indulge me for a minute. You know, when I, I have so many people in my district who are very, very, very special. And <coughs> that's because they spend so many hours and so many years and so much time doing volunteer services for their community. And one of those people is here tonight, and I would like for you to join me in honoring her. Where is she? Where is Ronnie? She's outside. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie Debbie. So we, we, have, we have these things, I call them building blocks, community bricks. She's a brick. So this is a special brick for Ronnie. And thank you, Ronnie, for all that you do uh, for all of us in Brooklyn and in the whole city. Thank you. I'll just thank people up front so we don't have to break again. Ronnie, come get your brick. So uh, I want to thank Susan Long. Where is Susan, my chief of staff? Where are you, Susan? This is Susan. And uh, Shakti, where is Shakti? Where is Shakti? There's Shakti, our wonderful assistant. Uh, Deborah Moore, where is Deborah? Um, Oscar, Jonas, Oscar, thank you. Oscar got us this wonderful space. Um, Jason, Jason Salmon, where's Jason Salmon? He's out right outside checking people in still. And two wonderful young people, uh, both of whom are students uh, of the uh, New York City College of New York City. Kingsborough, Kingsborough College, I'm sorry. And, but they are now interns in my office. So that's Tanisha Tallard, where's Tanisha? Tanisha, thank you. And Catherine Valdez, Catherine, thank you. And I have one of my staff people came down all the way from Albany, where is Raquel? She's my Raquel is outside. Raquel is our legislative uh, council. Um, let me also thank very much our Senate Media Services people, Adam, Jamie, and they want me to mention Eric, the director, but we really thank them. They're here. So, uh, uh, Eric is in Albany. We thank you, Eric, just the same. And uh, those are our, our, uh, my staff, and uh, I will ask that Senator John Liu thanks his staff, but while we're at it, we can just say thank you to Lisa. We know Lisa. Where are you, Lisa? Are you here? So, for the two of us, it's Lisa, and Susan. And let me say that uh, we owe a special thank you to NYU. And this school now uh, has a, a dean who runs this part of the NYU institution who is a woman. So this is the year of the woman, and we thank them very much. Dr. Jalina Kovacinik. Kovacinik. Kovanchevic, Dr. Jelena, 
Let me just do that. Dr. Dr. Jelena, we thank you very much and congratulate you for this. <clears throat> the person who was responsible for getting us this space, Saynor. Thank you, Saynor. Jennifer, Jason, and Lenny's. Thank you all. And uh, let us begin this very, very important discussion. As you know, this has been going on. There's, the, there's talk in the legislature. There's movement in the legislature around this issue. So we came, and I want to thank my colleague, um, Senator Liu, for making sure that we had an opportunity in our borough to speak to him around this issue. So you're here. Uh, at our invitation, but we really want you to know that you're speaking to the chair of the New York Senate, New York State Senate uh, uh, Committee on New York City Education, John Liu. So, we're also joined by Senator Myrie, Zelnor Myrie. We're also joined by Senator Prasad. We're also joined by Senator Kevin Parker. We're also joined by Assemblywoman Joanne Simon. We're also joined by Assemblymember Colton. And we're also joined by Senator uh, Granadas. So we're all here to listen to you, and uh, I want to just invite uh, Senator Liu to open our session up because he is going to be listening very, very carefully uh, from each of you who are here to bring testimony. And thank you again for coming. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. All your share. Thank you, Senator Montgomery. Let's give this wonderful senator a round of applause. Our fantastic leader, Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins, has given me the responsibility of chairing the Senate's Standing Committee on New York City Education. Uh, but no matter what the titles are, I got to tell you, Senator Montgomery has been fighting the fight for quality education for every student in New York City. For a very long time, and while I may have the chair's title, I will tell you from the outset that I take great direction and also insight and experience from Senator Montgomery. Thank you, Valmonet, for hosting us tonight. I, I want to thank all of our colleagues in the legislature and bosses for coming to say a few opening remarks. This is as we announced forum. Forum of anybody who wishes to speak on this issue and that's exactly what we're doing today and the reason we had to do this is because last year when the city the city of New York and the Department of Education put forth a proposal they did so without talking to very many people in fact they did so by segment population of our city and that cannot the basis or starting point for any kind of change in public policy, especially one so, one so uh, are talking about. So before we can consider any kind of public policy going forward, we need to hear voices. We need to especially hear voices who were excluded from any kind of hearing. Lab. I imagine all of you are here. Now, the process by which we held these forums, we have you know, today, no, no day is ideal. So I know people are wondering, well, why are we doing this on a Friday night? The, the 
the reality is of it. Monday through Wednesday. So the only other days are Thursdays and other kinds of forums and hearings as well, including on, on the rent laws of the state of New York, which is uh, going to affect millions of people, among other issues. Never the perfect day. It's available. We did not... We did not target or give special invitations to anybody else found out. And anybody who's contacted us the flyer that uh, has wonderful pictures of Velma and Montgomery and Roxanne Persaud and myself. Uh, next time we'll get everybody's mugs in there, <laughs> okay? But I didn't mean this. And uh, as such, I would ask you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would ask you to respect everybody's ability an opportunity to say their piece, to give their opinion and suggestions. Uh, and let's keep the applauses and the boos down to minimal, such as zero. So please, no applauses, no booing. If you have signs, you know, the signs don't make any noise, but remember, they block the people behind you. So unless you're in the back row, be respectful of the people behind you as well. And with that, uh, I'm, we're going to have each speaker being no more than three minutes. If you have written testimony, please present it to us so that we can include it in the record. This is being live broadcast on the Senate website. If anybody wants to see it, it's uh, nysenate.gov, nysenate.gov. It's as simple as that. It'll be live streamed on the website and also recorded in the archives. So your comments will be recorded in prosperity. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to ask if any of my colleagues would like to say anything. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to make a final, I want to echo what Senator Montgomery has already said, to thank our incredible staff for putting this together. It's a lot of work to organize this kind of forum. Uh, I, you know, Senator, Mon I want to thank my entire staff, but especially uh, my chief of staff, Lisa Delaquila. Lisa, raise your hand. And uh, as I mentioned to Senator Montgomery before, like these last, this last month, every time I talk to Lisa, she's always talking about Susan, Susan Leung, who is the chief of staff for Senator Montgomery. So Susan, thank you very much. I hope you'll give me my chief of staff back one of these days. <laughs> With that, um, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to get this forum going. Uh, and uh, would any of, anybody like to? No. Okay, terrific. Well, then we're going to get started. And the first, the first person is Ivan Khan. Ivan, come up. You'll get the, the podium here. The clock is right here for your three minutes. And uh, following Ivan, we have Fiona Chen and Terry Ann Lawrence. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ivan Khan. I'm a lifelong New York City public school student, a graduate of the Bronx High School of Science, and I also serve as a CEO of Constitutorial, a supplemental education program with 11 locations serving the outer boroughs of New York City, primarily with low-income immigrants and, and minorities. For the past five years, our team has worked to increase the number of black and Hispanic students at the specialized high schools through fully covered scholarships and community-based partnerships in North Brooklyn, Harlem, and throughout the outer boroughs of New York City. Firstly, I'd like to thank our dedicated Senate members for taking the time to engage our community that supports equity, achievement, and access in our beloved public schools. I'm speaking today to share some of the best practices that we've seen work for minority children from low-income neighborhoods to gain offers. Alan Arias recently wrote an eloquent op-ed in AM New York about our STEM partnership in North Brooklyn, and we couldn't be prouder of his work. The biggest factor helping our children was their early focus on grade-level proficiency. 
every spring since grade school. Right now, only 25%, a quarter of black and Latinx children are grade level proficient in ELA and math in our beloved city. And if only 44% of Latin, black and Latinx children are applying to the specialized high schools, we'll continue to only admit 10 to 11%. That's one fourth times one, um, times four tenths, that comes up to one tenth. That's a travesty, and improving grade level proficiency is our very first step for our city. In the late 80s, as a student in PS19 and Corona, I was placed in the top section, IGCSP classes, along mostly with black and Latinx children. And we all worked hard to stay in that group until the last report card every single June. That became our de facto GNT program, and it did not require a citywide exam for a four-year-old. It was present in every single school, from Corona to Southeast Queens, all the way to middle school. Although these IGC and SP classes existed, the programs varied in effectiveness due to disparities in teacher training and lack of funding in black and Latinx public schools. I spent my second grade at PS19 in Corona in a trailer next to the actual school, which eventually became a second school building, replacing the schoolyard due to the overcrowding in our working class neighborhoods. I went to middle school with smaller classes and better trained teachers. In fact, they made sure to have three accelerated groups, not just one creating an environment where a lot of us aspired to get into great high schools. During the Giuliani era, IGC and SP became wiped out in our black and Latinx neighborhoods. Later, the Bloomberg administration made that problem worse by deciding to decentralize the accelerated programs due to all the disparities. Though the DOE had promised access to these scarce district-wide programs, they never provided the transportation or the bus services to facilitate the awareness for high-achieving underrepresented black and Latinx families. I support bringing back equitable funding for our schools, transporting and reporting by the DOE, and a complete revamp of the current GNT structure, which will emphasize Renzulli training for teachers and administrators in every single school. I personally oppose a centralized exam for a four-year-old child that supports the same entry pathway, and I do support the same entry pathways of the 80s and 90s. I'd like to finally echo my support for the SHSAT, as it's been a vehicle for thousands of low-income minorities to get a great education in our city. I support the doubling of specialized high school seats to ensure that there is a different type of pathway for every single high-achieving learner. I thank you for your time and I reiterate my support for the expansion of accelerated classes that flourished in the 80s and 90s, limiting class sizes, increasing culturally rele relevant education, and expanding the number of specialized high school seats and pathways. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Fiona Chen and I am a sixth grader at IS-187. I am here today to show my support for the SHSAT. So my brother set a very good example for me. He came back to the US at four years old and didn't know how to speak English, so he took the GNT test in Chinese and scored high enough to win a seat in our Title I elementary school's tag class. My brother, a formal ESL student, is now going to Stuyvesant High School in the fall. So we are super proud of him. My family showed me that by studying and working hard, anything is possible. So my parents are immigrants, and they also work very hard to provide for our family. I have learned that you don't get anything for free, and you need to earn your way. I know some people think that this, that testing is unfair, but I don't think so. So testing is a very objective measurement that shows how well you know something. It's Teachers Appreciation Week, and I want to take this opportunity to thank all my teachers for their dedication and hard work. My brother and I wouldn't be where we are today without their support and guidance. They always have high expectations for us and push us to do our very best. Some of our elementary school teachers are retiring at the end of 
this school year. I am very happy for them, but sad for the school because it's losing these incredible teachers who set good examples for younger generations. I never had a teacher tell me or my classmates that if we don't do well on a test, she would scrap the test. SHSAT is not the problem. By eliminating the test, we are not correcting the real issues. I urge the mayor, chancellor, and legislators to keep the test, set high standards, standards for all schools in New York City so every school is a strong and GNT school. Thank you. She came in within her three minutes. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> Terry Ann Lawrence to be followed by Berlin Andal Blake and Tabson Chowdhury. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, um, my name is Terry Ann Lawrence, and I am currently a Sophie Davis student at City College. I'm graduating this year from the undergraduate portion. And I will be starting medical school in September. So I attended Benjamin Banneker Academy. And one thing that I want to highlight today is mentorship. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for ment my mentors. And Sometimes you would see students and they have the talents, they have the capabilities, but they just need someone to sort of like water that seed of greatness within them and to help fertilize it. And that's what having a mentor did for me. Um, I just want to give a beautiful shout out to the YWCA Brooklyn um, for my mentors there. And um, my mentor, Mr. Abney, Dr. Pernell, Mr. Perlman, and even Dr. Comrie. Um, so, I always knew that I was interested in medicine, and I said, you know what, this is what I'm interested in, I'm going to find someone to help me. And I was fortunate enough to find mentors. However, there are some students, they don't have mentors, and they need someone to sit down with, but they, they don't know where to look, they don't know where to find it. And so I, it would be amazing if more schools, if students have mentors, if there are more mentoring programs in, in certain high schools, that would be really helpful. I had to do a lot of searching outside of my school, looking for outside programs to help me, even with the college application process. My mentors at the YWCA Brooklyn helped me with the college application process, helped me to revise my essays and check to make sure that everything is in place when I was applying to different high, sorry, to different colleges and things of that nature. So that is highly important. Um, so that's the highlight of what I'm basically trying to bring to the table. A lot of times students, they feel as though they're not capable. They feel as though they are less than. And it's all about where the resources are going. Do they have access to certain resources? Do they know who to turn to? And if they don't have access to these things, then they will go on without being able to tap into their true purpose. And it's all about equity. It's all about uh, equal distribution. And that is something that has brought me to where I am today, and so that is what I'm here to speak for. Thank you so much for listening. That, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Berlin, uh, Terry Ann Lawrence. Next we have Berlin Andal Blake. Come on up. <laughs> to be followed by Tabson Chowdhury and Charles Vavruska. Good evening, everyone. My name is Berlin Ando Blake. I am born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I am currently a freshman at NYU Tandem, majoring in computer science. And above all, I am a proud alumni of Brooklyn Technical High School. 
My time at Brooklyn Technical High School was very fruitful and the best time of my life. As a member of Brooklyn Tech's Nesby chapter, I was given the opportunity to travel to different states, attend conferences, compete in national and regional competitions, and network with STEM professionals. My time BT in my time at BTHS, I have interacted with so many amazing students and faculty members, won so many awards, attended outstanding events, performed my school's orchestra, and helped out my school community. And nowadays, I sit back and think about what would happen to me if I had never taken an SHSAT. Maybe I would have been part of the other large group of low-income minority students who had their dreams cut short due to financial difficulties and social dis disparities. The SHSAT provides students from all backgrounds an equal opportunity to get accepted into one of New York City's finest schools. And most of the students who are taking these tests are low-income, high-achieving minority students who are going to be first gens. And even though I am a hardcore supporter in the SHSAT, I believe that there's some, there should be some changes to be made. Recently, I was making a web app that provides resources and guidelines to students who are taking the SHSAT, and I was shocked by a small amount of free in-person SHSAT prep courses. And I was even more shocked by the prices of these prep courses that's offered by popular tomb programs, such as Kaplan, Summa, and Princeton, Princeton Review. The prices range from $800 to almost $1,200. Students who come from middle to upper class families have the ability to attend these top prep courses. But however, for students who come from low income households, they cannot attend these courses because $1,200 is equivalent to a month's worth of groceries or a month's worth of rent. I believe that is unfair for students from low income backgrounds to suffer because of their family's income. And this is why I believe that there should be a free citywide SHSAT prep course for students who come from low income backgrounds. So that each and every single student can have a fair chance at a brightest future. We need to invest in our students, in our children's future because they are the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Berlin. Uh, Tabson Chowdhury, to be followed by Charles Varuska and Leo Nee. And uh, by the way, the order of speakers was in the order of arrival. Tabson, floor is yours. How are you doing? I'm Tassin Chowdhury. I've had the humble honor of serving as the president of the Stuyvesant Student Union. My parents immigrated to New York City from Bangladesh in the mid-90s looking for better opportunities. My father has worked at a deli for over three dec decades, and my mother has delivered newspapers for over a decade. Now she's a home health aide. I've attended public school my entire life. Like many first-generation immigrants, my story is not too different from those of immigrants before me, whether they be from South America, West Africa, East Asia, the Caribbean, or the West Indies. As a first-generation immigrant, I absolutely support measures to increase diversity at the specialized high schools. The fact that only about 11% of black and Hispanic students getting into specialized high schools is deeply tied to grade three to eight proficiency. In 2018, black and Hispanic students only compromised a 44% of applicants when proficiency levels are at 25% across New York City. Mathematically, one would expect about 11% of offers to go to black and Hispanic students. We're failing our black and Hispanic students long before the transition to high school. It's a systemic failure. One of the most discriminatory practices my community and I have ever experienced was when the mayor and chancellor attempted to pass legislation affecting the SJSAT with less than two weeks left in the session. Not a single Asian community leader was consulted. This isn't a political game, it's our children's education. Rather than consider the mayor's proposal as the only solution to the diversity problem, leaders in the Senate and the Assembly have the power to bring back accelerated programs we've faced out, like IGC, SP, and honors programs. I've yet to understand how failing 75% of our black and Hispanic students across the city is acceptable. We have the ability to target students who are struggling and we have the ability to support them, yet the DOE time and time again fails to do so. Corona, one of the largest hubs of the, of the Latinx community in New York City, also happens to have some of the most overcrowded schools New York City has ever seen. Overcrowding means students sitting on radiators and in the hallways. It means having a, a gymnatorium, a combined cafeteria, gymnasium, and uh, auditorium, shared between multiple schools squeezed into one building. It also means refusing to give our students an equitable opportunity. Everyone deserves the same opportunity I had. It's about time we expand the specialized high schools and create more pathways to high 
high achieving schools while integrating from a much earlier age. Thank you for holding this hearing and allowing me to speak on behalf of Bangladeshi New Yorkers. I look forward to the rest of the commentary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tassin. Tassin Chowdhury, thank you. All right, Charles Varuska to be followed by Leo Nee and Eric Zhang. Hello, welcome. I want to thank the committee for giving me this opportunity to speak. I love this city, and I'm proud that this city has these great specialized high schools, which have provided opportunity for generations of New York City's children to attend the best schools. And that doesn't happen everywhere. But I'm sad. I'm sad that since Chancellor Carranza has been here, I haven't seen him do anything to try to prove education. What I have seen him do is to increase racial division. That's terrible. And when I look at his plan to get rid of the SHSAT, I see it as a cover-up, for a cover-up for a failure in K-8 education. When, ch when, ch Every time I hear Chancellor Carranza say equity, I think that's code words for bringing all children down. Oh, we seen last week in the Mathgate scandal that parents are being perpetrated a fraud on our parents by giving them grades that are fraudulent. What we're seeing is some schools where only 2% of the children are meeting state standard, yet 93% of them are passing their math test. That's fraud. And if we're going to tell parents they don't know that their children aren't learning basic math, that's fraud, and we've got to change that. And I implore this panel to investigate this math gate and get rid of this grade fraud and make sure every parent knows what their children are doing so they can hold their teachers accountable, they can hold the principals accountable, and they can hold Chancellor Carranza and Mayor de Blasio accountable. <laughs> what is troubling? is that instead of getting rid of the SHSAT, Chancellor Carranza wants to rely more on grades. But many of these grades are fraudulent. <laughs> How can we say we want to take people's grades when the grades are fraudulent? We need to change this. We need to keep the SHSAT, because the SHSAT is the canary in the coal mine for this fraud. What we can do, what we can do, is I urge you to pass the gifted and talented bills in both the Assembly and the Senate, which will bring back SP programs, honors programs, and IGC classes in all of our schools. Thank you. Mr. Baruska, where, where does your child attend school? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Leo Lee to be followed by Eric Zhang and Zoe. Zoe Nee? Okay. Leo Nee. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Leo Nee. And before I start, um, those are all, all of the signatures we got in support of the SHSAT from my community and borough of Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm currently a, also a student at IS-187. Uh, actually, I'm in the same class as Fiona, and our school, on average, does pretty well on the SHSAT. But why does it do so well? 
It's because of skill, not because of skin. And the SHSHT judges only on pure skill and only skill. And now the DOE wants to induce a quota into it, which I think is racist. It doesn't fix any of our problems, but only makes more problems for us. Think of it like this. There are a thousand different color sheep that are testing against each other. Also, there's a group of people controlling the test called the NYC DOE. The top winners will get their chance at a better life for themselves. And the DOE sees that some colors of sheep are winning more than others. If they try to help the losing ones, yes, it will be hard, but it's what they're supposed to do. And instead, they decided to cancel the test and instead just put some of each animal into the winner's pile. And they're okay with that. But the sheep that had spent so much time and effort into achieving their goals, but didn't win anyway, will suffer. And even the sheep that luckily got picked as a winner were really just insulted, and their luck has only increased their pain. They will suffer as well because a quota does not fulfill the purpose of making the sheep better. And after that, with a different judge named Life, life is hard. Life is harsh, and most importantly, life will not give you free passes just because of the, your color. Life only chooses skill and not skin. So because of the villain of the story, the DOE, there's no happy ending even for just these innocent sheep. But this kind of thing is happening in real life. In 2014, the mayor allocated $150 million to improve 94 schools. And three years later, there were only three schools that made progress. So it is hard. But the DOE has to find a better way to do it. So what should the DOE do? They should find the true source of the problem and deal with it the hard way. They have to create more GNT programs and fix K-8 schools. And this is what the DOE has to do for the kids that are, are not getting the high scores on the SHSAT instead of canceling it. And remember that only tests give us qualified results and quotas are racist. So if we want to help all NYC st students, we need to fix K-8, to we need to create more GNT programs, and we need to keep the test. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leo Ni. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person will be Eric Zhang, followed by Zoe Ni nee and Joanne Brown. Eric, come on up. Yeah, you, you can, why don't you use it first and then give it to us afterwards. Let me also note that we've been joined by New York State Assembly Member Walter Mosley. Thank you, Assembly Member Walt Mosley, for joining us. My name is Eric Zhang, and I am a fifth grader in school PS204. I don't get why the SHSAT is being canceled. Tests were created to analyze what we have learned. Am I wrong? So the SHSAT tells high school administration how much you understand both English language arts and math concepts. People say it might be unfair that specialized high schools are full of students from Asian descendants, but even though there are, they may be a lot of Asians, each and every one of them work very hard to get into those schools. If you want to make the SHSAT an irrelevant, then you might as well make all tests unimportant. Let's say you are trying to get a driver's license, but you can drive bumper cars really well. Does that mean you could just drive because of that? There would be a lot more accidents because they don't know what signs mean, and drivers will lose control of the vehicle. All people were created equally, and racism was a problem, but blacks fought for their freedom. Asians are fighting for their education. From 1976 to 1994, Brook Brooklyn Tech students were majority African American or Latino. That shows that as long as you work hard, you can get into good high schools anyways. Everyone has the ability to get into specialized high school. This source is reliable and fair for everyone. If you want more diversity, then why don't you just make more specialized high school for all the top students and not be racist about it? If everyone who couldn't get into a specialized high school worked harder, anyone could would easily get in. 
You could have made more specialized high schools, more GNT programs, fixed elementary schools, fixed middle schools. Getting rid of the SHSAT seemed like the easiest option. Instead of the options, in my opinion, are better for the community, such as creating more specialized high schools or enriching education in K through eight grades. School was created to enrich everyone's education, but getting rid of the criteria and picking people out of a hat is very illogical. The test is only to give us qualif the test is the only way to get, get give us qualif get us qualified results about how we do in school. Education is judged on skill, not skin. So I'm supporting to keep the test. So we'll we'll send this back to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. E for penmanship. All right. Um, our, now, our next person is Zoe Nee, to be followed by Joanne Brown and Larry Carey. I want to ask you, if, if your name is called up, if you're on deck, please come down so we can, I want to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. So come down if you get called on deck. Uh, I'm going to ask if a couple of these people can, those two, two seats in the front row, you can relinquish. Okay. All right, come on down, uh, Zoe Nee, to be followed by Joanne Brown and Larry Carey. And also, could you please put your cell phones on silent or vibrate? Thank you. Wow. Hi, my name is Zoe Nee, and I am currently in the elementary school at my senior year. Next year, I'm going to William McKinley Superintendent slash Honors Program. As we all know, the government, governor, Bill de Blasio, feels the need to discriminate children like me, take out the better education opportunity. The thing, or should I say test, that our governor is proposing to take away is the SHSAT. This test determines practically our future. Just as um, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, has once said, but in different terms, said, if you kill your enemies, you're wrong. It is basically the same scenario. If Bill de Blasio t takes a test from us, it will kill our opportunity, which is wrong. And then he hands it to, to people who aren't prepared for, might not be prepared for the stress and <coughs> then might fall into depression or anxiety or even worse, fail their classes and exams. He's not fixing any problem. He's just making more problems. Um, speaking about the test, it has a story. Like the story my father once told me about um, of the honest boy. Once upon a time, a king wanted to find an honest child to replace him as a king, since he was getting old. He gave the children of the country a seed. He said that whoever grew the most beautiful flower from his seed will be the next king. But what the kids didn't know was that the seed was cook cooked and it couldn't be grown into a flower. Finally, an honest child passes the king's test. You can see that the test can detect the honesty and Oh, wait, can detect the honesty and detect the real you. So this story proves to us that when you don't know what a test is about, it will detect your true capability with your smarts. So I'm not only here to speak about my own test, I'm ta also talking about others. Sure, you might say, well, what if they do succeed? Well, look at the hundreds of other students you're affecting. Look how much bright minds you might lose. It is about the future of Asian students, the future of NYC. Of course, others will say there's too much Asian in specialized high schools. But the way I see it is that they're all quite biased because the test wasn't made for us. It was made for all kids who wanted to attend specialized high schools. And the people who mark the test most likely don't, d doesn't know anyone taking the test and wouldn't let them in bec because they know them. Like every other test, it is what it is. So for the test, it should be no different, no different. And I see no point in canceling this test or changing anything about it because it is like any other test. The test is not the problem. We need opportunity for all kids, not for the skin. So my point is to keep the test. <laughs> okay, Joanne Brown, followed by Larry Carey and Vincent Liu. Good luck, Ms. Brown, following that. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Thank you. I only came here to listen to what everybody else was talking about. Just take the mic out, because, yeah, please. Just lift it out. That's good. I don't want to break it. That's what it was. Okay, thank you. I came here to listen, to hear what everybody was talking about. But I'm in a high school. I'm in Wayne Gay High School. And there's a lot of, a lot of diversity is there. And then by you saying that, that you want the SAT, but I would like very much for you, if it's possible, for you to bring the SAT, well, like, not the exam itself, but like someone could come there to our school, I'm talking about to all the high schools, not just one, but to all the high schools, so that they could be able to, to learn and then how to be more, um, more straightforward on these exams, but when they go against these exams, they don't know what they're going for and how to do their math or either the reading or either whatever writing or whatever that they have to do so that they can keep up well with these specialized high schools. I, I applaud the specialized high schools, but, they, but if you have to look at the elementary part too, I'm talking about across the board. Some of the elementary students and also the high schools, that does, they do not have the opportunity to have our mentors and all these other people to come out and then teach them and then be, be as one. This is what we really need in our high schools so that our teachers can be better, more teachers than they are now. And I applaud them and I thank them so very much for helping our students. But right now, they need all of the help they can get right now so they can compete against all these serious kids. It's not about no black and white and about no SAT. This is all I heard about black and white or either somebody else is doing. No, it's not. It's just our kids, we don't have the money or the ability to keep up with y'all. And this is why our kids are failing. So most of our parents and most of our children are living in a shelter. Okay, see, these are the people that you don't see. I applaud everybody that's up here, but I like to stay right here because I can see what's going on in regular school. I don't went to elementary, I don't went to middle school, now I'm in high school, but I'm keeping up with everyone. But I would like very much if you do keep it, the SAT, but please, can you put it in there well for the kids to learn to as well? Because this is what they're lacking, okay? They also need workshops. I'm talking about like wood, wood our making, our metal making, cooking classes. I'm just, they need all of these things, okay? So I would say you can get out here in this world. This is a very cruel world. Our kids are going out here blindfolded, but they need the help and the guidance from all of us, okay? Not, not no, just no anybody. I said all of us, and there's no black and white either, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Larry Carey is up next. On deck, Vincent Liu and Cloris Lee. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's on. It's on. on. It's on. It's on. I can scream louder. I don't need the mic. Just talk there. Hello. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, before I say anything, I want to congratulate an alum of Brooklyn Tech for his election. We applaud you. You are a member of our foundation automatically. Come to our meetings, please. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and give them money. <laughs> and give them money. <laughs> you know, the, this was advertised as a, uh, uh, a request to hear ideas about solving the problem. And we all know the problem is real and it's significant. Um, and it's not an easy problem to solve. But there are some things which we do, um, we have to respect in terms of the truth. If you go back in history, and this is not ancient history to me, but for some people it might be. Brooklyn Tech in 1976, the majority of its student body was black and Latino. 
There were 2,014 black students at Brooklyn Tech in 1976. They all got in because of the test. Uh, and for tw nearly 20 years, a majority of our school was black and Latino. Today, that's not the case. Today, the school is predominantly Asian. It's changed. The question becomes why? We do not believe that the fault of the demographic situation is the test, but rather the failure of the city to properly prepare people to do well on the test. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the need for expanded, gifted, and talented. The reality is there was, back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, there was an extensive program of gifted and talented. There was an extensive program of enriched education in the middle schools, and that's all gone. Mayor Bloomberg wiped out gifted and talented for the most part because he mandated one uniform test and you had to get a 90 on the exam. And if you didn't get a 90, then you weren't eligible. And then for the black and the Hispanic communities, quote unquote, they didn't have enough kids doing well enough on the test in order to form a gifted and talented program. And so they had none as a result. Now today, in 10 districts in this city, where you have 90% of the population is black and Latino, you have one or none in terms of gifted and talented. You cannot say that we are giving every kid in this city the opportunity to do well on the test when we don't provide them with the requisite educational experiences to do that. We call for a massive expansion of gifted and talented, I'll tell you the truth, if the kid doesn't do well enough on the test, give us the top kids doing well on that test in every school, and let's create a gifted and talented program, and let's do it each and every year for those kids' lives to prepare them. And it will work. You know, people, I, I spent the whole morning listening to uh, other speakers at the Senate where I talked, and people talked about the peer effect. Well, let's give these kids the peer effect. Let's give them a program that really works. Thank you, but Kerry. thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Vincent Liu. Vincent Liu to be followed by, by Cloris Lee and Cole Yi Chen. Cloris Lee and Cole Yi Chen. Go ahead, Vincent. Good evening. As a father of two and someone also graduated from the New York City public education system, I'm very disappointed to see how our city nowadays handles our public education. Instead of helping our students, our city chose to waste resource on putting one minority group against another and scapegoating an objective exam for their failure in handling public education. Our students from poor community are falling behind academically. Based on a test result from 2018, from those communities, nearly 75% of students are not proficient at their grade level in both English and math. The SHSAT exam is aimed at assessing students for above grade level academic performance. So here's my question to everyone. How do we expect those student to score high enough on SHSAT when they are not even proficient at their um, grade level? And how exactly the purpose of eliminating the SHSAT help those students to perform better? The answer is obviously no, it does not. All it does is covering up the real problem and deflect the attention needed to fix it. Although our mayor and DOE chancellor keep ignoring this, it's really a common sense that the result of the SHSAT exam is just a diagnose which we affirm that we have problem in our K-8 education. The solution should be focused on fixing our K-8, not eliminating a test. With city's proposal, we are penalizing the high achieving students and blocking their equal access to the education they deserve and we all know that it's just a political cheese shot that does the opposite of helping our students. Instead of, uh, rather than eliminating it, we should provide more resources to help those that don't do well on the exam. So here I urge to keep the SHSAT in its current form 
as it's the most objective way we can ensure equal access to our education system for all our students. Again, we need to fix the real problem, provide the real help, and most importantly, please do not politicalize our education system. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Cloris Lee, to be followed by Cole Yi Chen and Jonathan Roberts. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Cloris Lee, and I'm currently a sixth grader attending IS-187, the Chris McCullough School. I'm here to support the SHSAT, and I fully believe that the test should be kept. Governor Cuomo, Mayor de Blasio, and Chancellor Carranza are taking away the SHSAT. Take, taking away the SHSAT is taking away many chances of many, many students. And everyone should have the chance to take it, no matter your race, no matter your color, no matter where you live, and no matter your looks. You just have to try. When I go to eighth grade in 2021, the SHSAT won't be there anymore. And I won't have the chance of getting into a specialized high school and a better high school, which means I will have a smaller chance of getting into a good college. And my chances of getting into a good, high paid job will be even slimmer. If I work hard, shouldn't I have a higher advantage than those who don't even try? Instead, they are the ones they are the ones having a higher advantage because while I'm taking practice exams, studying, doing my work, and trying my best, other students are probably just watching TV, playing video games, and not even trying. It's just not right for me to work hard and do my best while others are being lazy and, get, and they get into specialized high schools. Meanwhile, I have to go to a bad high school. It's not fair for me to do my best while others are just simply being lazy. The SHSAT can't be taken away because the government can't admit their own mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just, I want I, a couple of uh, responses. I really feel um, very, very proud and thank those parents who brought the children, the young people, these are elementary and middle school young people, and they are being prepared for leadership right now. So I, I want to thank them. These are, and uh, let me just say, it does not matter which high school they end up in. They're going to be leaders because they are being, they're being trained to, for leadership from home and right now. So they are not going to wait to high school. I, I, I do want to say to the parents of those children, be very careful how you prepare them for this argument. We should not assume that because a group of young people that we're fighting about, we would like to see more of in those schools, it's not that they didn't get in the school because they're lazy. So that, that is a very, now I'm talking, I'm talking to the parents. I'm talking to the parents. It is your responsibility, it is an obligation that you make sure that those children do not internalize those racist attitudes about any group. So I want to just put that out there. And I, I think Senator, Senator Persaud, Senator Persaud would like to address this issue as well. I am just going to follow up. Senator Montgomery said some of the things I wanted to say. This is a listening tour, per se. We are asking you to bring us ideas, bring us how, on an understanding of what you're going through. We are not asking anyone to pit one group against another. This is not what this is about. This by no means, this by no means is anything against any one ethnic group. This is not what we're about. If anyone in here believes that we're pitting groups against each other, 
I suggest you think carefully about that. That is not the conversation we're having. That is not the kind of environment that we're trying to, to have. This has nothing to do, as I said, with any ethnic group. This has to do with an educational issue that we see there's a need for change. I don't think there's anyone who in good conscience would say the system is, is correct the way it is. The system does not need fixing. I don't think anyone, again, in good conscience can say it is okay the way the system is, that we should not look at it. That's what we're asking people to do today. We are not asking anyone to pit one group against another. By doing that, you're not doing anyone a favor. You're not helping any group, whether it's the, an Asian group, it's an African-American group, a Latinx group. You're not helping anyone by having that kind of a conversation. Thank you. Stop it. Stop it. You're out of order. You're not helping the process. Sir, you're not helping the process. You are, you are not helping. You are not helping. Please. You're not helping. If you would like to speak, get on the list. All right. Let's get back to the forum because we have a lot of people to hear from. All right. Let's continue with this forum. I do want to say that I agree with everything Senator Montgomery and Senator Persaud said, but I also want to, I want to point out that Cloris Lee, the, the uh, student who we just heard from, never mentioned anything about race. She did. She did. Okay. Now, I've been around for a long time, <laughs> all right? Um, almost as long as Senator Montgomery. She has a couple years on me. I think I've been around longer than Senator Prasad. <laughs> she readily says yes, okay? Um, and sometimes, big people, adults, we already made certain assumptions because we have, we have been through a lot of discussions, we've read a lot of things, and you know, I think it's important, even though I don't think Senator Montgomery and, or Senator Persaud said it explicitly. I'm going to say it explicitly. Sometimes when people say, when people call other people lazy, that is often viewed by the African-American community as code word for African-Americans, for being the reason that they somehow were not able to do well on a test. So let's just put it out there. And that is why there's a caution to parents that, you know, parents, when you have a child as young as Cloris, she probably is going to be significantly influenced by what the parents are saying. Nonetheless, Cloris did not say anything about race. And I can also tell you that, you know, I know a little bit about the Asian community. I'm, I'm Asian. I've been Asian my whole life. Really? And, you know, when I was growing up, and now I see, you know, not only my son, but uh, my nephews and nieces, when we, when we say lazy people, we're not talking about anybody from any other race. We're talking about, a lot of times, about siblings, and about cousins, and about other people that you're going to school with. And so when we say, when, when people in the Asian American community say lazy, there's not necessarily a direct correlation to race. There is simply, please, they're simply using an adjective that they learned in the English language. No more, no less, the people, the kids that they're comparing those, themselves against and the kids that they're being compared against are their, their kids that are closest to them, their family members, the students that they're going to school with. So in this discussion, and I, when I announced this set of forum, uh, the, this series of forums, forums with Senator Montgomery and some of the other legislators here, we said that this issue has been too divisive. And it has, as some of the speakers said today, 
pit communities against each other, unnecessarily so. I am of the strong belief that out of this controversy, this very emotional, fee, uh, emotional issue, we can actually bring communities together. We're going to bring communities together, number one, by listening to each other and understanding what each other are saying. And then from that, figure out what changes, if necessary, should be enacted to bring our city, our state, and indeed our country forward. But we do so thoughtfully and open-mindedly, and let's listen to everybody, everything that everybody's saying carefully and not make assumptions about what they're saying. With that, please, no, uh, no response, please, because uh, I think the speakers are doing very well. It's the audience that's keeping us, uh, getting us behind on the time. And we have over about 60 speakers. So we want to hear from everybody. And, it's, and, you know, the people who signed up late, they, have an, they are entitled to be heard also. So let's call up Cole Yi Chen to be followed by Jonathan Roberts and John Kwok. That's exactly what they're doing. Hi, my name is Chloe Chen, and I'm currently a sixth grader at the IS 187 Krista McAuliffe School. I'm also a second generation Asian American. My parents and grandparents all immigrated to America. My grandparents worked in sweatshops so that I could have a better future here. They work hard so I can live the American dream, the dream that if you work hard, you'll advance in society. The SHSAT is part of that dream. Anybody can take the test, and it doesn't matter how you look, where you live, or how you would sound in, in, in an interview. You just have to work hard. If you can't get into a good high school, it lessens your chances of getting into a good college, which also decreases the chances of getting a good job, therefore expect, um, affecting the future forever. With the new plan that Mayor de Blasio proposed, the chances of a student at my school, Krista McAuliffe, getting into a specialized high school would be much slimmer than a student who goes to a school that may not be performing as well academically. Currently, my school sends many of its students to specialized high schools per year. With this new plan in place, we would lose around 186 offers, leaving around 19 spots in total for our school. Students from our other schools who may not work as hard would get a higher chance of getting into a specialized high school, even though our grades are just as good or even better. We should have an equal amount of chance and opportunity as everybody else from another school to go to a specialized high school. Getting rid of the SHSAT would come as an expense to students who work extremely hard to get into these top schools. Thank you. Thank you, Koyi. Jonathan Roberts is up. On deck, John Kwok and Martin Brooks. Thank you. Hi. Um, hear me? Good? OK. You know, in light of the small number of black and Latino students who are both willing and able to qualify for the specialized high schools, I urge the New York State Legislature to take all steps within its power to implement the following three programs. Number one, hire enough additional teachers in underperforming elementary and middle schools in order to reduce class sizes by 25%. Number two, recruit 1,000 new math and science teachers for low-achieving elementary and middle schools. Offer enough compensation to attract and retain highly qualified and talented teachers. And number three is to restore rigorous math and science advancement enrichment programs in underserved communities for all students who want that challenge. Now, recently, an independent analysis by the Department of Education 
fully validated the SHSAT as an admissions method. But using grades is a horrible idea. A 90... <laughs> only got three minutes. A 90 in a Sunset Park middle school means something completely different from a 90 in one in Bedford-Stuyvesant. <laughs> grades, grades are influenced by student likability, teacher leniency, different course rigor, and currying favors. Are you the teacher's pet? I was not. The test is the least biased. So all tests have some bias, but the test is the least biased and least corruptible method that we know of right now. We must keep admissions to be about what you know, not who you know. The SHSAT is simply exposing our large racial achievement gap. But changing specialized high school admissions affects less than 2% of all students and does nothing to educate or empower our black and Latino youth. Tests today are under attack because they reveal very unpleasant truths. They're partial truths but they're truths nonetheless. <laughs> Papering over the diagnosis condemns future generations of black and Latino youth to lives of unfulfilled potential. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. John Kwok, on deck is Martin Brooks and Yatin Chu. Before I begin, I should note that early this morning, I sent Senator Liu uh, an extended uh, document of my testimony. So I will try to keep my remarks brief, but I will ask Senator Liu to pass on to those here tonight, sitting with him, copies of that testimony. I am a Stuyvesant alumnus. I am by training a former evolution biologist with a background in invertebrate paleobiology and evolutionary ecology. I'm a longtime member of the National Center for Science Education, which is the foremost public organization de devoted to fostering the teaching of evolution and climate science here, here in the United States. I'm also a longtime volunteer with the World Science Festival. However, tonight I am only speaking for myself, not for both of these organizations, though I will note that as a World Science Festival science ambassador, at some of its events, its City of Science events, I have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of black and Latino kids and their parents interested and excited about STEM. Clearly, this is a, a serious issue that needs to be addressed, and I don't think it's being addressed seriously from what I've heard from, quote, diversity and desegregation advocates. The SAT, SAT is a symptom. It is not the cause for the low number of students you are now seeing in these communities who are, are attending my alma mater, Stuyvesant, and the other New York City specialized high schools. These numbers will not be addressed until New York City government officials deal with the root causes, which are the absence of gifted and talented programs and the absence of a strong commitment for STEM education, starting in first grade, if not earlier, for all students, especially for the black and Latino student populations largely absent from the New York City specialized public high schools. Uh, I will note that having been interested in looking at science denialism around the world, it is fair to say that those who are advocating diversity and de desegregation are no different than those who believe vaccines should not be administered because they falsely believe, because they falsely believe that aut vaccines cause autism. Uh, it, it's not only me, but uh, others recognize that many science denialist movements use the same thinking and tactics that you see from the extreme progressives and radical leftists. It is a appropriate, unfortunately, that today's hearing is held in Brooklyn because we have two Brooklyn institutions that have aided and abetted these 
organizations. The Brooklyn Book Festival had two panels four years ago uh, condemning school choice and what was called segregation, class, and race in the New York City public schools. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let me just quickly finish, if I may, Mr. No, Lou. Uh, we have a lot of people to hear from. Mr. Brooks, jo uh, Martin Brooks, thank you. to be followed by Yatin Chu and Keith Allah. In my opinion, if the students can't do the math and don't have the reading comprehension skills, admitting them to the specialized schools is just setting them up for failure. It's completely nonsensical in spite of the worthy objective to create more diversity in these schools. The question that should really be asked is, why can't the top 10% of students in each school do well on the test? LaGuardia High School of the Performing Arts gives potential students in its art, drama, dance, and music programs, both an audition and a test assignment. I've never heard anyone say that if they didn't have enough diversity, that they should get rid of those tests. If you're not gonna do it for drama, music, and, and, and art students, why would you do it for STEM programs? Right. We're trying to fix the problem in the wrong place. The place where the problem needs to be fixed is at the elementary, middle, and junior high school level. I recommend the following. These are certainly more complex, will take more time, and will need far more funding than simply eliminating the test. But I believe that they're far better solutions that will attempt to solve the real problems. One, collect data on the percentage of students in each feeder school that take the test and get admission. In schools that don't reach the proper hurdle rate, hold the principals accountable. Yes. Two, Start programs in every feeder school, especially those underrepresented in the specialized high schools, to prepare students for the test. Three, require every specialized high school to conduct outreach programs. I know some are doing it already, but they need to be increased with specific goals for the number of schools they visit and the number of students they meet with. Four, create at least one magnet middle or junior high school feeder school in each borough which is administered by the specialized high schools with admission by lottery. Five, if space permits, open a small feeder school within each specialized high school, also with admission by lottery. Create a practice SHSAT, and obviously improve the quality of education at the middle and junior high school level. I really don't understand why we're trying to destroy the high schools that work so well instead of trying to fix the high schools that don't. In my opinion, eliminating the SHSAT will destroy the specialized high schools because they will have to lower their standards in order to remediate the students. And then they will be no different than the rest of the high schools. And there's one more issue. Let's say action is taken and a far greater number of students qualify for these schools. That'll actually make it harder to get in. So in addition to everything else, we need to create more specialized high schools. Personally, I'd like to see the High School of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, the High School of Information Technology, the High School of Advanced Business Processes and the High School of Media Studies, for starters. One of my high school history teachers always wanted to see Brooklyn Cultural High School. There's a fundamental misconception that a student who doesn't do well on the test but has good grades can, can succeed at the specialized high school. Thank you, it's Mr. Quote, Brooks. Let me just finish the sentence. <laughs> a better school. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. All right, Yatin Chu. On deck is Keith Alla and Veda Clay. Good evening, senators and assembly members. Thank you for spending your Friday evening with us. Um, my name is Yatin Chu. I'm a parent of two public school children and a Bronx Science alumnus. Abolishing Hecalandra and allowing de Blasio to decide the specialized high school emissions is like having the fox guard the hen house. As comptroller in 2013, Senator Liu released an audit of the DOE's application process for screened high schools. The audit found that, quote, the DOE lacks adequate controls to ensure an accurate screening and ranking of the students who apply for admissions. As a result of these weaknesses, the possibility of inappropriate manipulation of student rankings, favoritism, 
or fraud is, being, is not being adequately controlled, end quote. None of these problems have been fixed. The mayor's proposed ranking process cannot be trusted to be fair and equitable. We cannot let him extend this to the specialized high school admissions. Don't believe the fake news discrediting the SHSAT. The test was proven in a predictive, to be predictive of academic performance in high schools in a study commissioned by the DOE. But de Blasio didn't like the results and covered up for five years. Notably, notably, the study went out of its way to say that the strength of the SHSAT's predictive ability is unlike any study that he has seen in social sciences. Just as LaGuardia uses auditions to assess talent for performing arts, the SHSAT is an audition for STEM talent. Should the mayor put an end to auditions for LaGuardia and simply offer seats to the top 7% of students? I believe Jamani Williams echoed the same sentiment earlier today. As others have noted, why isn't the mayor replicating the feeder schools so that more schools can prepare well for this test? Instead, he chose to penalize these schools. Furthermore, his plan marginalizes families that chose non-public middle schools because their public school options were so bad. Just 2% of these students will win a lottery spot at the specialized high school. Last and most important, instead of giving all eighth graders the opportunity, the mayor's proposal shuts out 93% of them at the outset. This is not equity. This is a quota. In conclusion, the SHSAT has been scientifically proven to be the single most objective, predictive, and equitable emission standard. It provides 100% of NYC students the opportunity to high caliber STEM education and must remain as the sole criterion of admissions to the specialized high schools. Thank you very much. Keith Alla, Keith Alla, followed by Veda Clay and Isabella Pavon. Hello, my name is Keith from Dreams Youth Build. Um, Dreams Youth Build is a program that helps students from who have dropped out of high school and have fallen through the cracks get back on their feet with the HSE. Dreams is also has several have, excuse me, I'm sorry, has several components besides getting the HSE. They have an on-site social worker, we do community service, and we have in-class tutoring. I believe this is very important, not just for um, programs trying to get the HSC, but for actual high school. Because if, the, if high school has these type of programs in place to begin with, you, you won't need programs like Dreams for kids to fall back on. Too many kids fall through the cracks and they slip through because they feel they are alone in high school. They feel that when they get to high school, they have nobody to talk to when they're going through mental health issues. They feel when they get to class that they don't know the work, they can't ask for help. They feel that when they feel unsafe in school, so, so now programs like Dream open up that create a community environment and really give kids a second chance at college and, and just to succeed in their life without giving up and becoming consistent. I believe Dreams, I believe Dreams, um, excuse me, I believe high school should adopt Dreams model and have an on-site social worker instead of a guidance counselor that just talks to you about your class schedule and where you're going to college. Have a guidance counselor talk to you about what's going on in your personal life, what's going on at home, because those things affect your school and affect your grades, and then when it gets to the test, you're too worried about other things. You're too worried about what's going on at home, um, how I'm gonna get home, what I'm gonna do when I get home, am I gonna make it school tomorrow? It's too many other things to focus on just the test. So now when the grades come and the grades fall, now it's looked on as you're not intelligent. So, and that's what I just wanted to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith Allah. Next is Veda Clay, to be followed by Isabella Pavon and Terry Ann Lawrence. Come on down if you guys are here. Hello, hi, my name is Jada Clay. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be reading off my phone. Jada, okay. It's okay. 
I'm a student at Dreams Youth Boat. I've been attending Dreams for about four months. Before Dreams, I struggled in school and didn't feel like I was receiving support I truly needed to be successful in a traditional schooling system. My high school lacked materials and opportunities for me to properly be educated as well as graduate on time. The lack of support made me feel uncomfortable in the setting and I was told I, desper I, was told I desperately needed in order to achieve my goals and dreams. Also coming from a single parent household, I found myself working so hard I could provide I found myself working so I could provide for myself and a household um, and for my household at a young age. Life happens when I didn't take the traditional life happens. I didn't take the traditional path for schooling, but I'm doing everything in my power to get the education I know I need and deserve. Alternative school programs are needed for students like myself. They are made to provide education and support those who are not going down the traditional path. I'm happy to attend dreams because I found my second family. Thank you, Jada. Isabella Pavone, to be followed by Terry Ann Lawrence and Karen Barbanel. Good evening, everyone. First, I just wanted to say a well thank you to the New York State Senate and the Assembly members who are here today to discuss an important issue, education equity and New York City education. I'm a high school senior and three months ago, there were only 788 future graduates from my class. Presently, there are now only 800 students who are set to graduate in 2019. These numbers may have increased by a small amount. However, my actual size class is nearly 1,000 students. With the 200 students who aren't graduating, I wondered if they did have access and were provided with more college counselors and advisors, if they would be graduating with me and my fellow classmates next month. With a large class size and only one counselor advisor for college, I was not granted the one-on-one -on -one sessions I needed through the college process. I was forced to go outside my school to look for programs that can help guide me through these rigorous processes. I was thankful and able to find the program, such as YWCA Brooklyn, to help me in applying to colleges and preparation for college by tutoring for the SAT. Continuing education after high school is extremely important. And with teachers telling me constantly expressing the importance of gaining a higher education, we want to continue after high school to graduate with the degree in bachelor's and even in master's. But how can we have a solid opportunity in attending college if we are only being provided with the bare minimum in help with just one college advisor? We need an equal opportunity for all, and I am not receiving the opportunity at my school. Thank you once again. Thank you, Isabella. Um, I said Terry Ann Lawrence was on deck, but uh, Terry Ann already spoke earlier. So you only need to sign these lists once, by the way. Uh, Karen Barbanel, to be followed by Mary Alice Miller and George Lee. Karen Barbanel. Thank you. So I'm the parent of grads of Stuyvesant, and I have another child in another test in high school. I wouldn't have gotten into these schools, just so you know. I did volunteer in PS306 PS in Bed-Stuy, it's a grammar school. I volunteered with reading partners. Without fail, a significant portion of the kids who I was helping weren't testing into needing extra help because they were slow. They were so bored by the curriculum that they were checking out and acting up. I recognized it immediately because my kids behaved the exact same way. All were kids of color, some were Somali immigrants, some came from families that seemed enormous but were more like extended families, including teens who brought home their children, some were more traditional families. All of these kids, all of these kids were so smart. Some were gifted to boot and being gifted and being smarter a bit different. None were being appropriately educated by their school. Why are these children not being recognized as deserving of gifted and talented programs? Why are they being thrown away? Because their parents don't vote? Don't try to tell us that eighth graders can magically be popped into a high stress, high activity environment and not suffer from depression and imposter syndrome issues. Even kids who are well prepared are suffering more and more due to societal changes. Taking kids who don't have adequate tools and social supports into specialized schools is literally like throwing non-swimmers off the deep end of the dock. They'll drown. 
Look at what happened at Harvey Mudd, an exceptional school. I don't, do you guys know Harvey Mudd in California? Yes. Okay. Um, they followed every protocol to give students positive starts in a high achieving school community. They had enormous numbers of suicides. It was a disaster. It was horrible. And the, t and the woman who runs that school spoke on NPR. She spoke all over. I strongly encourage every parent to listen to that. So this is the risk you're taking with society's children, with our children. It's a kind of cruelty that boggles the mind of every caring person. And HMU spent years creating protocols to support success. The current city administration just wants to drop pubescent kids, already a tough time, into a new challenging environment with essentially no preparation for students or teachers. What could possibly go wrong? Seriously, how cavalier can you be with children's lives? Now let's take a look at the other vulnerable, historically low voter turnout community you're bashing. It's in style to bash Chinese populations. Look at our current federal administration. Do these families look wealthy to you? Do they look un-American to you? Or do they just not look like your people or your voters? And I'm speaking that to the mayor and others, not to these people here. Our current school's chancellor has bragged more than once that he couldn't pass geometry, which is 10th grade math. He recently walked out on the mail African-American New York State Teacher of the Year during that teacher's speech. I don't see a single parent in this room who would let their child get away with spewing such garbage or behaving so rudely. There isn't a single union construction job available to someone who couldn't pass that high school test. And nowhere in society should such dismissiveness of someone's achievements be acceptable behavior. Thank you, Ms. Barbernell. Thank you very much. And we have your written testimony. OK. Uh, Mary Alice, I gave you a heads up, but I don't, you may not have known. So you want to go now, or you want to go next? OK, we'll hear from George Lee to be followed by Mary Alice Miller and then Wei Wei Huang. Please. My name is George Lee. I came from a assembly hearing this morning. And boy, did I hear a lot of nonsense about the PS uh, SHSAT not being valid. I hear things like, no single test should determine high school admissions. I hear things like, the test has never been validated. I hear things like, this study, I don't know who, my study shows that grades are better than tests. I hear things that go like, James Heckman's study shows that, grades, that, that the standardized tests don't work. I read that paper, by the way. It's a complete misquote. I heard people say things like, Doobie and Fry, this is a city hall uh, hearing. Doobie and Friday's paper shows that standardized that the SSACT doesn't work. I read that paper, that's a misquote too. But all these alleged research that the SSACT is not valid, something is not right. Groucho Marx has a very good saying. He said, whom you gonna believe, me or your own eyes, okay? There's these people purported research saying the SHSAT doesn't work. Then there's my eyes. And what do I see with my eyes? 14 Nobel Prize winners. 14, that's more, more than most countries. I see Intel winners, Siemens winners, Westinghouse winners, Regeneron winners. I see people who bring home gold medals in math Olympiads, physical Olympiads. <clears throat> I see courses, Physics C, AP Physics C, multivariable calculus. These courses are only offered in the specialized high schools in New York City. I checked, I checked. Only Hunter College High School, which is not under the DOE, also does the same thing. So we have students there who can do that level of work. That's what I see with my eyes. So I'm not going to believe in those studies. I believe in my eyes. And I recommend that next time somebody piles on you this bull crap that the SSAT doesn't work, hasn't been validated, research studies show this, research studies show that, believe in your own eyes, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Mary, Alice, do you want to just take the mic down there? Why don't you just take the mic down there? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Be followed by Weiwei Huang and Donghui Zhang. Okay. I'm going to say something that I have not heard anybody else say at the hearings, and maybe it's because they're too polite to say it, but I don't care about being polite. High-achieving African-American and Hispanic youth scholars cannot compete with a culture that has no problem with cheating on standardized tests. After the last hearing, I Googled cheating on standardized tests in Asia and in the United States. Here is some of what I came up with including cheating in Stuyvesant in 20, 2012 and 2019, just last month in April. Cheating is so rampant in Asia that China had to pass a law that would um, give people seven years in prison for cheating on standardized tests. There have been literal riots when test takers were not allowed to cheat during the test. And everything I'm saying now and I'm getting ready to say, I have documentation. Cram school tutors have provided actual test questions in advance to their students who go to their schools. There have been all manner of apparatus that have been used to cheat on standardized tests that would make James Bond and Maxwell Smart jealous. And I have pictures of some of that stuff in here. With people who got arrested, who um, were sentenced to prison sentences, who had to forfeit their tests, all kinds of stuff. Some of the newer immigrants who have come here after I went to Stuyvesant in the 70s and my sisters went to Stuyvesant, so behind me, have come with that cultural milieu of cheating on standardized tests. Let's tell the truth. Look it up yourself. There have been documented cheating in Stuyvesant, like I said, in 2012 and 2019. There's been documented cheating on the SAT, the ACT, and the Regents' exams. Some have mastered the art of cheating on standardized tests, while others don't even consider it. Obviously, the standardized tests can be gained. Standardized tests do not ma measure the entirety of a student's intelligence or cap capability to master challenging material. This is the reason why increasing numbers of colleges are not using standardized tests in their admissions criteria. They have found students who gain standardized tests also cheat in college by having others take entire courses for them besides cheating on the test. This is a serious public policy issue. People who cheat on standardized tests and coursework cannot be trusted to be competent doctors, dentists, engineers, etc. Thank you. I have heard individuals say that they are wary of professionals who come from a culture that embraces cheating. Th thank you, Mary Alice. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wei Wei Huang, to be followed by Dong Wei Zhang and Tom Shepard. But this is just some of the stuff I found. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Take a look. Thank you, senators, for giving us. Uh, Uh, thank you, senators, for giving us a precious chance to speak up our concern. I say precious because everyone knows people like me was excluded from the beginning. And as you said, people like me, like us, are also New, York, New Yorkers. We are also taxpayers, and we are also voters. So thanks for, thanks for giving us a precious chance to speak up. Actually, my topic is very simple. Uh, I would like to say racial gap is not racial bias. 
the SHSAT test is not the root cause of ratio gaps. Like a mirror, it only objectively reflects the widening ratio gaps observed in education, especially for black students. Actually, black students were once accepted to the specialized high school at significantly higher rates than today. In 1989, Brooklyn Tech student body was 51 percentage black and Hispanic. Today, it's less than 12 percentage. I honestly, I don't know what's the underlying reasons for this significant decrease, possibly social, cultural, education, or economic status. But oh, I would like to say that majority of Asian, Asian students who are currently in the specialized high school actually come from no or very no poor families. So what I want to say is that the test and the least schools are not owned, coded, owned by Asian students, as the Chancellor, Mr. Carranza, falsely claimed. The test itself is not a racial bias. Uh, I believe here is more data. I think I will share with you later. It's a 2017 eighth grade state test, I say state test performance. Only about 11% of black students pass level three and four. Again, we can see significant ratio gaps here. 56% of Asian students passed level three and four whereas only 11% of black students who passed level three and four. Also, the percentage of black students who passed level three and four significantly decreases from about 30% uh, for third graders uh, to 11% for eighth graders. However, can we say that this state test is ratio bias? Can we say that the test itself caused 90% of black students to fail to have a basic math knowledge? How about to eliminate this state test or any test altogether because they are racial bias? I believe that everyone will say such questions are stupid and misleading. Blaming a test that just objectively reflects racial gaps is the easiest way for some public officials with their own personal political agenda. Thank you, Ms. Wang. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dong, Dong Hui Zhang to be followed by Tom Shepard and Elwin Av, or Elwin Ao. Dong Hui Zhang. Uh, next up is Tom Shepard and Elwin Ao. If you guys could, whoever's on deck, please come down to the front row. Mr. Zhang, please proceed. OK. Thank you, Senator Ru, and all the senators and all assemblymen to host this hearing process. I'm the president of New York City Residence Lands. I'm also a proud father of two New York City public school students, one in Stevenson and one in coming Bronx Science. They study, they learn, they take the test, they succeed the test, and then they go to the special high schools, which is fair and objective. They will continue to learn in high school and college, and then serve our community and country. So merit-based admission and competition is what keeps our schools rigorous, keep our city prosperous, and keep our nation strong. We are here defending this. M Mr. Mayor and Mr. Chancellor told us the test preparation was a waste of time. We say no, the test inspires students to learn, just like the Olympics inspire the athletics to practice. And as a parent of two school kids and a, a long-time student myself, I know the test preparation, the test, and the test review after the test are most important part of the, of the learning process. It should be encouraged, but not blamed. They were also attacking the test materials were not consistent with the teaching materials. OK, then propose your own test, or, or make it as two tests or three tests, as long as it's, it's ob objective. We are also here defending the civil rights of Asian children. Their every child are born equal under the US Constitution, and they should be treated equally. And actually, I would like to suggest, in the future the mission process, please make a color blind. Don't ask what, what color the, the children is. 
They are black, they are Asian, they are white, they are Latino, does that really matter? They are all American kids, and they all have the same American dream. <laughs> the mayor and the, the chancellor say Asian families have economic advantage to take the prep class. I say no, 70% of the Asian students in Stevenson High School receive free lunch program and they are from low income families. Their income is not much more than the un unemployment benefits. The only reason that the Asians can succeed is, about, is because the, car, the family care about the education. They invest all their money, the time, and the attention to the kids' learning, and that's how they succeed. And that's something should be encouraged, should be awarded, should be modeled, but not penalized. <laughs> the, the mayor and the chancellor were disgustingly discriminating the Asian kids by thinking there were too many of them in the various high schools and want to limit their enrollment. That's simply racism and cannot be tolerated in the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Tom Shepard, followed by Elwin Ao and Yan Yu. I would like to thank the committee for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you. My name is Thomas Shepard. First, I'm a father of three children currently attending New York City Public Schools. I'm an education advocate and a member of the District 11 Community Education Council in the Bronx. I work with community elected officials and the Alliance for Quality Education in addressing education equity issues facing our children and families. I also attended Brooklyn Tech in the 1980s. So I have a long statement here, but I'm just gonna kinda deviate from this a little bit. People, we really have to be careful about the message we're sending. All right, I've been sitting here all night and my blood has been boiling because we've been using code words, we've been going after each other, and it's completely inappropriate. Now, with that being said, in my district, there are nine children in the entire school district that were given offers to specialized high schools this fall. Nine in an entire school district. Now, if anybody can sit here with a straight face and tell me that the system is working when nine kids in an entire school district, not a school, but a school district, are offered letters to a specialized high school, I would say you're crazy. All right, now, whether we fix, I mean, whether we re get rid of the SHSAT or, uh, you know, use that as the only means of, you know, evaluating kids for admissions to schools, that's really for you guys to decide, okay? Um, Prince, I, you know, being in the CEC, I have, gone to several schools, middle schools in my district, and have spoken to principals and educators, and they all agree that a single high stakes test does not measure whether or not a child is prepared for, for admission to these high schools. What I would suggest, what I would suggest is maybe not getting rid of the test, maybe changing it in some sort of way, but also making it about the entire student. Okay, we can, we can look at a student's performance in terms of grade point average. We can look at their, their scores on an ELA. We can look at a portfolio. We can also look at an SHSAT, but a single measure to evaluate whether or not these kids are admitted to a specialized high school, according to the educators and according to tons of research, is inappropriate. And I think that we can, we can agree or we can disagree, but what we do need is some sort of change from the way that things are right now. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. And Mr. Shepard, if you have your written testimony, please, you can email it to us. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you can get it from Heather right there. She's sitting right there. Thank you. 
All right, uh, Elwin Au is up to be followed by Yan Yu and Victoria Araskina. Young people. <clears throat> uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am a seventh grade student who next year will be taking the SHSAT unless they take it away from the one chance I may have to get into a proper high school. Okay, so now since the uh, administration wants to take away the, uh, the SHSAT because they're worried about the demographic or uh, the, the di distribution of the races, that is not the problem here because we can't uh, set a quota for something that people can't control. We can't, uh, people can't control how they're educated unless people, uh, people can, uh, unless people in the administration will help us uh, revamp the K to eight uh, system so that we can actually get a proper education. See, if, uh, if certain ethnicities aren't scoring well, then that means there must be a problem in, the, uh, in their education or in their district if their uh, teachers are uh, overworked or their class sizes are way too big or their facilities are completely uh, uh, unusable, then you have to take notice and actually try to do something about it. Any person who has even a little common sense that everyone has, is supposed to have equal opportunity in a world like this, especially like the, t uh, a test, uh, like the SHSAT, if you have the SHSAT, we can have a very objective view of how well a student does and how well uh, they can perform. We must learn that we, can, uh, we must judge on merit, not on uh, what color of their skin is or what, uh, what, uh, what uh, grades they get. We have to understand that uh, how well they do and how well they understand the material that they are given and what is required of them to enter these schools is very crucial to, uh, to establishing a well-developed uh, well uh, generation that has uh, adequate education and can uh, carry our future. Uh, we can't deny that people are disadvantaged in some ways. But that doesn't mean that everyone, uh, everyone either has an advantage or a disadvantage. See, not everyone has resources at, uh, on hand, and we have to fix that by providing better resources in our schools. See, when uh, the DOE, uh, when, the, uh, when our chancellor is announcing that the SHSAT, uh, that they're considering uh, removing the SHSAT, uh, I, I, am, uh, I had to wonder, why am I studying so hard? I'm in seventh grade, I've worked almost my entire life trying, uh, trying to get myself ready. And I can't, uh, probably most of the people here won't understand my anguish if someone uh, takes away the SHSAT just before I'm about to take it. Thank you, Elwin. Thank you very much. All right. Yan Yu, to be followed by Victoria Araskina and Sophia Fan. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thank you, senators, for being here to listen to our voice. We know that Mayor de Blasio does not care about our voice. My name is Yan Yu. My son is attending MS74. I have been working as an educator in New York City for 18 years. But tonight, I'm here, like so many of you, to support the SHSAT. And I'm here to say we, Asian Americans, are so angry and we're so disappointed about Mayor, De, about Mayor De, Blas, De Blasio and Mr. Carranza. Why the mayor and the chancellor have to pit one minority group against another minority group? The truth is that De Blasio and Carranza are politicians who don't really care about education, not Asian American children's education, and definitely not black and Hispanic children's education either, because...
Getting rid of one single test is not the way to help any child to learn better. We all know what the root problem is. Look at the result from the state ELA and math exam. Black and Hispanic children's scores are far below the Asian and white students from the very beginning of their academic journey. If the mayor and the chancellor are sincere about help, helping the black and Hispanic children, then they should focus on fixing the broken part of the education, that is, fix the pop, pipeline, fix the K-8 to grades education. Don't sit there and watch these children fail and then pretend to save them after it is too late. <laughs> Don't be hypocrites. We know that 50 to over 60% of children from the specialized high schools are from economically, economically disadvantaged families who are qualified for free lunch according to federal laws. Many of them are from humble families in which both parents are working around the clock to support these children's American dreams. I encourage you to watch the documentary named Tested. After I watched it, I cannot help crying. I only have one child. I'm here not for my child, for all the child, children. How can the mayor <laughs> fall into a sleep in the middle of the night if he robs the only opportunity that these underprivileged children have access to? Talking about access, every year there are more than 1,500 black and Hispanic children being admitted to high-performing charter schools with full, full or near full scholarship. Many of them are doing beautifully at the charter schools, and these children have these children have a better route to succeed than taking the she's at. So this is also partially contributes to the low rate of participation of she's she's at Thank among you, the high-performing black. Thank you, Ms. Yu. Thank so to you. Just we one more sentence. Victoria Eraskina. We've got, we've got 30 more people. Okay. Okay. Victoria Eraskina. But Ms. Yu, if, you know, I'm going to be around. So if anybody wants to stay afterwards, I'm happy to talk more with you. And we'll even record it. But let's get everybody a chance to say their piece. All right. Uh, this is Sophia Fan. I'm sorry, Victoria Erskina to be followed by Sophia Fan and Nada Al Alhagov. This is kind of terrifying. <laughs> but, um, well, first of all, why not test the teachers? Okay. Do. They do. They do. They can, they, they can consider doing a little bit of a more rigorous job um, preparing all teachers in all schools equally. Um, the other point is, well, why not mandate all students to take the SHSAT and offer it locally? Um, I understand that cheating is a huge issue. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, I wouldn't know um, too much about it. I, Understand cheating might be like probably expensive. I couldn't afford any prep programs. My only preparation for the exam was um, I was I had a free eight year education prior to it. Um, I went to zoned schools. Um, there was no exam, like no prep exam. Um, but what I do have to say is that there was a mentality of valuing education in my household. I came to this country when I was six, um, and my mom didn't know any English. She worked two jobs, went to Kingsborough, then Brooklyn Tech. She you know, had two kids to feed, and she would stay up till two in the morning doing her college work, and we would stay up with her. Um, what I want to say is that we're ignoring the key word specialized in this discussion, I think, because even if all Hispanic and black students attend specialized high schools, that will only be a few more, a few more thousand students. Um, a few more thousand compared to the tens of thousands of black and Hispanic students is not that much. I think we really do need to focus more on the long-term improvement instead of, you know, Getting rid of the thermometer because it indicated the fever is, 
it, it, it's nice for some politicians who want to run for higher office to say, look how, how I fixed this big racial disparity in education. But um, <laughs> ultimately, um, I, you know, with, with, the, with people saying that the problem is financial, I, I came to this country and my first night I slept in a coat closet and then the next two months I slept on a discarded leather coated like car seat we picked up from the trash. Um, I, didn't, I didn't pay extra, but I'd like to say that we need to improve equality generationally. It's going to take at least eight years, but we're going to do it right instead of just pouring super glue on a broken bone. Thank you, Ms. Um, thank you. Okay, Sophia Fan, to be followed by Nada Alhagov and Julie Huang. Sophia Fan, is Nada Alhagov here? Please come on deck. And Julie Huang, come on deck. <coughs> All right, you have the floor, Sophia. Hello, my name is Sophia and I am in the eight, 11th grade. I would like to address the issue of inequitable distribution of resources in New York City, which marginalizes our students by their race and social economic background. We are using a system where our students are selected to attend a few selected quality schools. Quality education is a right and not a privilege. Specialized high schools and the SHSET as a single admissions measure not only limit opportunities to receive a quality education, but also creates a competitive environment that is detrimental to the emotional and academic growth of our students. We need an equitable education system that promotes awareness and availability of resources beneficial to students. In addition to the types of resources, People who come from different backgrounds, including ethnic groups, social economic status, and gender need different quality resources that fully address their needs. Schools with majority black and Latinx students have to deal with policing and metal detectors that disrupt their academic and emotional growth. Rather than investing in school police, we should invest into counselors and quality resources for these students. Improving upon these conditions will support a diverse and integrated environment where students can be happy, healthy, and successful in their own unique ways. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. Next is Na Nada Alhagav. Al Alnagar. Alnagar. Uh, to be followed by Julie Huang and Luke Davenport. Good evening. My name is Nada, and I'm a junior at a specialized high school. I went to a middle school, IS-187, where the majority of students received and accepted offers to specialized high schools, despite being, a part, being in a part of Brooklyn where there are not enough middle schools. At IS-187, we enjoyed flight simula simulators, MacBooks, and a highly motivated student body. But the bubble I lived in left me ignorant to the struggles that many students across New York City faced. I broke this bubble when I met students at my school who came from schools where they were the only student accepted into a specialized high school. Many people may associate students from these schools with a poor work ethic and low motivation to achieve, but they had no knowledge of the SHSAT until the month before the test. The information they did receive was vague and poorly presented, yet today they are some of the most high achieving students at my school. When schools are not well integrated, we cannot see the potential of students across the city. As a result, our protect our perception is narrowed to a single idea of what other communities look like, one that is built on stereotypes and misconceptions that diffuse quickly because no one is there to correct them. But students capable of excelling academically exist in all parts of the city, yet the student populations of specialized high schools are far from reflecting that. The SHSAT has existed for decades. 
yet it has continued to exclude some of the brightest students in the city by looking at every student through the same broken lens. It doesn't take into account work ethic, determination to succeed, character, and so many other characteristics that truly represent a student's ability to succeed and impact positive change in the world. When you say fix K-8 to but not the test, you imply that the SHSAT is an effective way to evaluate students, which has no substantial proof. There is no proof that students who excel on the SHSAT are any more capable of success than students who do poorly. There are so many other factors that can measure a student's ability to make an impact on the world. And if we began using them, we would certainly see a rise in both geographical and racial representation representation in specialized high schools. Even beyond the SHSAT, we should also consider what puts specialized high schools offers in such high demand every year. Many of my friends at my school commute for over an hour because they cannot guarantee they will receive a high quality education at nearby schools. For a few of my friends, the SHSAT was a chance to escape the under-resourcing and overcrowding that characterizes too many New York City schools. The role but the SHSAT has excluded the vast majority because only a single factor was considered. The role of specialized high schools in New York City should not be to provide a safe haven for students who live near under-resourced neighborhood schools. Rather, they should be a place for students genuinely interested in the academic and social programs of the school. Currently, many students enrolled in specialized high schools do so simply because the prestige of the school when considering high schools to enroll in, students should have a wide array of options to choose from. They should not opt for schools because their name or prestige guarantees a better education. Thank you, Nada. Thank you very much. All right. Wonderful. Julie Huang to be followed by Luke Davenport and Si Hui Zhang. Uh, Julie Huang here? I thought that was her coming down. All right, Luke Davenport, to be followed by Sihui Zhang and Lin Tan. Thank you, Luke. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Liu. Thank you to the members of the committee for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Luke Davenport. Uh, in my day job, I analyze data for New York City schools but I'm actually here in my capacity today as a member of the New York City's Alliance for School Integration and Desegregation. Uh, ACID, we call ourselves, is an all-volunteer co coalition of over 1,000 parents, students, educators, researchers, and activists, uh, a diverse, broad cross-section of New Yorkers who are dedicated to ending school segregation and pushing for real integration in New York City public schools. Uh, we support the elimination of the Shazat as the sole entrance criteria for the specialized high schools, while also acknowledging that the specialized high schools are really just the tip of the iceberg. We have a much broader and deeper segregation problem in New York City. Um, but frankly, even without consideration for the diversity of the specialized high schools, there's ample reason to abandon the SHSAT. Uh, we know you, you'd be hard pressed to find an education expert who has studied this issue carefully who would ever recommend or endorse a sole uh, admission, a, sole, a single standardized test as sole criteria for admissions. The gentleman from CEC 11 made that case earlier. And there's good reason for it, right? We know there's study after study that shows that grades are more predictive of future academic success uh, than other, than standardized tests. That's a, a finding that's very consistent and rep repeated. Um, that's why almost every educated, you know, ed education expert will recommend multiple measures, um, not a single standardized test. Uh, but I also want to mention uh, we have a history with this, right? Um, this is not the first time we've had a debate around issues that affected school segregation. Um, and one of the things that you see in, 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 as you study this history, and that's something that we do a lot at ACID, is that there's a very clear pattern, right? You have every time there's an uh, action to desegregate or integrate schools, there's a backlash. And that backlash isn't always framed as, you know, we don't want to integrate. It's framed around other things, right? So regardless of the intention of those, uh, of those actions and that backlash, the the, the result is the same over and over again, decade after decade, we continue to entrench segregation. Uh, and we really have to take that history very seriously. But I wanna ask another um, bigger question, or perhaps equally big question, which is why are we so sure that separating students into special schools, special programs like specialized high schools, gifted and talented programs, and so on, why is it worth it? What is the evidence that supports that approach, which clearly has such a large cost attached? 
Um, in fact, there were two studies in 2014 that showed that students who uh, got into specialized high schools who had the same SHSAT course scores as those who didn't had the same outcomes in terms of what colleges they went to, uh, likeliness to succeed, and, and finish in those colleges. Right? Similarly, gifted and talented programs, the evidence is very mixed. There is a lot of studies that show that GNT programs have no marginal impact for those students. So why are we supporting these programs? More, moreover, even if we expand them by twice, we're still serving you know, 10% at most of our students. So I want to leave with that question, which is why are we continuing, uh, why are we continuing to do more things to separate students by academics, by race, my economics when we don't have good research for it. We have very strong research, and I encourage everyone to read a book called Children of the Dream. We have very strong research in favor of integrating schools. Thank you, Mr. Davenport. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> si Wei Zhang. Si Wei Zhang to be followed by Lin Tan and Peter Tung. Uh, I want to ask everybody to please refrain from certainly the booze, meaning B-O-O-S, and also refrain from the clapter so that we can get out. I was wrong before. We do not have an unlimited amount of time here. We do need to vacate by 9 p.m. And if everybody sticks to their time, we can hear everybody and get out of here by 9 p.m. Thank you very much. Ms. Zhang. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for staying. My name is Sophia. I grew up in China. I immigrated here when I was 15 as a mid-year freshman. I then intentionally chose to attend a diverse high school. I'm grateful that when I first came here without knowing how to speak English, my classmates were so willing to help me. We got to know each other by sharing our different ethnic backgrounds, my experience, learning experiences in China, or their family stories. My teachers would stay after school just to teach me, again, the lesson we have learned in class, making a connection with my culture and sometimes learn Chinese from me. I feel safe, I feel respected, I feel I belong here. Such a diverse and inclusive school provides a healthy learning environment for me. One time, I had a conversation with my friend in a Stevenson High School. I learned that their school are dominated by white and Asian and lack of diversity and integration. She talked about how she felt like living in a bubble around the same type of people. She is a friend with some black students in Stai, and she told me how her friends always feel not belong to school and question about themselves often. I learned that one specialized high school has sociology class that I have been wanted for a long time and have so many clubs, activities, opportunities that I was craving for. I learned that there are more than 400 high schools, yet resources are concentrated in a small portion of them. I learned that New York City, which is known for its diversity, has the most segregated school system. The current New York City school education school system doesn't narrow the inequality gap, but excludes students with socioeconomic disadvantages and exacerbates segregation due to the unequal distribution of resources and an inequitable screen system. According to the city, roughly 190 of the 830 middle and high schools screen all of their students. What is the selection criteria? by one single test, a number, a number that defines a child by a moment and takes student curiosity out of learning and tells the society that there's only one single way to measure a person. If the test is the standard, let's think about what it means to be a good student. What education, what education really means to you? What education means to me, means to us, a student, shouldn't just be about getting to a good college or look good in your transcript. It's about developing into a whole person. It's about learning for the sake of learning. Something is wrong when we take the test as a single measurement in high school admission process. With the screen system in the admission process, how can students who are, uh, who are underserved and left behind since young age Students who can pay for test prep, students know that they would not have equal chances as others exert their potentials. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you very much. Are you, are you Si Hui? Are you Si Hui? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next up, Lin Tan, to be followed by Peter Tung and David Rem. Yeah. 
I just earned my second master's degree in education at NYU this year. As a mother and educator, I'm here to support SHSAT. In my opinion, the mayor's proposal is an other case of politicians trying to earn political points by meddling in the education realm. Why should those who don't have any professional backgrounds in education make policies for our education system? How much do they know about the schools, the teachers, and the students? Educators at these specialized schools already pointed out that it is the students who make the schools special and outstanding. For instance, eight former students of Bronx High School of Science have received a Nobel Prize in Science more than any other secondary school in the world. Do you think this would have happened if Bronx Science does not have the most qualified students? On the other hand, as educators, we know that different students learn differently. We also know that whenever we try to tilt the teaching process for either the faster or slower students, it's unfair for the other group. Furthermore, I think students who got into those schools without qualified academic ac achievements would have a difficult time to compete and succeed among the fierce competitions. Therefore, the mayor's proposal would not meet the standards of these schools as they were intended to be. Some politicians said that the students who got high scores on the test were due to their families have money to pay for tutoring. Actually, 58% Asian American students in New York City live at close to or below the poverty line. I personally witnessed, witnessed a Chinese student who got into Stevenson High School while slept and studied in the living room for years with his family in a tiny apartment at a rundown co-op building. I think those politicians who blame the specialized high school admission system and want to cancel the test just want to earn political credits and votes for themselves. They're promoting <laughs> ethnic conflicts by abusing the rights of Asian students. If we want to talk about equality in education, we should not differentiate students by ethnic groups, but only by their academic performances. If we want to eliminate this discrimination in our society, we must eradicate it from education system first. So please keep the test. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lin Tan. Uh, Peter Tung I had called, but he is not going to speak. So next is David Rem. Is David Rem here? All right, all right, we'll come back to him. Um, let me ask Martha Camber. Is Martha here? All right, come on down. Martha Camber will be followed by uh, Yun Bao Guo and Tasfia Rahman. We'll come back to David Rem when he's back in the room. Welcome, Martha. To be followed by Yun Bao Guo and Tasfia Rahman. Uh, thank, I'd like to thank the um, the committee this evening for this opportunity for this hearing. I'm Martha Camber. I'm the CEO at the YWCA in Brooklyn, and mercifully, I am not going to talk about specialized high schools. <laughs> I'm here to talk about college access. The recent college admissions scandal has exposed what many of us already knew. Access to top colleges in this country is stacked against hardworking, high-achieving, low-income students, no matter how deserving they may be. What would college enrollment look like today if the playing field was truly level? We can answer that question because our college access program was established to do just that. Low-income, first-generation students of color 90% of who are African American, participate in academic enrichment and college prep. The same services that students attending 
better resource schools receive. Unsurprisingly, our students excel, and our 2019 graduating class had full scholarships to NYU, Dartmouth, Manhattanville, Marist, and other esteemed colleges. We know that college education is the most influential factor in determining mobility from poverty into the middle class. If we're truly going to support the economic development of low-income communities, including black and Latino communities, then we must address the education gap. Incomprehensibly, there is no requirement for college counselors in New York City public sc high schools. Guidance counselors who are often not trained in college advising have a ratio of one counselor to 250 students. One of our participants um, attends a high school that has 1,000 students for one counselor. Our experience with school personnel suggests they are invested in helping students prepare for college, but are simply doing the best they can with the resources they have. When one of our program participants informed her high school counselor that she wanted to apply for college, she was encouraged to go to the library and look for college catalogs. That was the extent of her advisement. Today, that same student is attending NYU on a full scholarship. She recently won an award as the freshman with the most promise. How many more students just like her have never had a chance to attend college simply because of poorly resourced public schools? The New York City public school system serves over one million students and through my work promoting college access for low-income students of color, I've come to recognize that systemic educational inequality is promoting a vast and astounding waste of human potential. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Yun Bao Guo, to be followed by Tasfia Rahman, and is David Rem back? Okay, so Yun Bao Guo, Tasfia Rahman, and then David Rem. Is Yun Bao Guo here? Tasfia Rahman, you are up. Come on down. Tasfia Rahman, to be followed by David Rem and Wai Wa Chin. Thank you for the, uh, giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and I will be speaking today both as a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, and as an alum of Brooklyn Technical High School, and also a Brooklyn native. As a Bangladeshi American raised in Bed-Stuy in the 90s and 2000s, I grew up in a diverse neighborhood with families and friends of different racial, ethnic, religious backgrounds. I went to an elementary school where even though standardized test scores were low, we learned about the civil rights movement, celebrated annual multicultural potlucks, and wrote fun essays about our cultural backgrounds. At the same time, faced with limited English proficiency, my parents were unable to navigate the school system and were too embarrassed to even speak with my teachers. So when I scored low on my standardized test they resorted to tutoring, which continued up until SHSAT. The pressure was intense. I was told that my future depended on a single test and I had one chance to prove my value, my worth. It was overwhelming and unbearable. That's what a single high stakes and pressure ridden test does to a 12 year old child. It creates a sense of impending failure and disappointment at a young and impressionable age. When you allow a single test to be the only standard of intelligence, you breed a toxic learning environment with students cheating, bragging about loss of sleep, and competing with each other, or even bullying each other based on differences. As a Muslim, I heard many Islamophobic comments being casually thrown around, but I'm also disgusted to look back at how, during college admissions time, I stood by and witnessed it. Many of my white and Asian Pacific American peers accused our black and Latinx identifying peers of getting into prestigious colleges based solely on their race. Equity and elitism do not go hand in hand. In a society stratified by race, elitism strengthens race racism. As elite schools and specialized high schools are not an exception to the entrenched racism that plagues the system. In fact, they embody it. The SHSAT, an exam that is rooted in anti-desegregation history, perpetuates segregation both outside and within these schools. A multiple measure admissions process is the first step in creating a more diverse, inclusive school environments that welcome the multitude of backgrounds and 
experience of our students and nurture their unique individual abilities and talents. Instead of advocating for more specialized high schools or gifted and talented programs that perpetuate elitism, we must advocate for building more and better quality schools in general. We must fight for funds owed to our public schools and better pay for our early childhood educators. We must invest in improving the social and emotional growth of our students, instituting culturally responsive education, and supporting students' mental health needs. Thank you. Thank you, Tasvia. Thank you, and for the cop. Thank you for the copies. Uh, David Rem, to be followed by Wai Wa Chen and Teresa Jordan. Okay. Good evening. Chancellor Carranza's introduction to all New Yorkers began with his three racist quotes. First one, wealthy white Manhattan parents rant angrily against plan to bring more black kids to their schools. Two, anyone who wants to keep the SHSAT test is a racist. Three, I don't just buy into the narrative that any one ethnic group owns admissions into these schools. I want to thank Senator John Liu for calling out Carranza's comments as racist. And for Liu's quote, and I quote, that nobody will forget or forgive Carranza for his racist comments. Thank you, John Liu. And I will add, no one should ever forget or forgive Carranza's racial ide ideology, and I call on de Blasio to fire Carranza for making such blatant racist statements. <laughs> the SHSAT test isn't the problem, and nor is getting rid of the test the solution. The real issue is the DOE's failure to provide a quality education for all children, and the DOE's refusal to be held accountable for failing all of our children. As the father of a Hispanic, Colombian, minority daughter born to a first-generation immigrant mother from Medellin, Colombia, Ava is a September 2019 accepted Stuyvesant stu student, having scored a 600 on her SAT, SAT exam, a perfect 4.5 on her New York State math test, and a 4.2 on her New York State ELA test. It is insulting to me to think that my minority, Latina, Hispanic daughter sh sh would somehow need the Blasio's discovery program to gain entry into the top specialized high school, namely Stuyvesant High School. I think Mona Davids, a black woman of color and president of New York City's parent union, best summed up the Blasio's and Carranza's racist policies when she stated, and again I quote, because de Blasio and Carranza have such racist, low expectations for black and Hispanic students, they feel they have to lower the standards for our children. They are the racists, said Miss Davids, who again is black. <laughs> Miss Davids continued, and I again quote her remarks word for word here. Carranza is attempting to use the race card to cover up the failures of New York City's K through 12 school system. We have hundreds of thousands of high school students who are not reading, writing, and doing math at grade level. And that is criminal, said Ms. Davids, end of quote. I am sick and disgusted of hearing Carranza's proposed policy which states to Asians and white children that because of their born skin colors, that they don't deserve to go to the very best eight specialized high schools. Carranza's blatant racist policies read, if you're white, you're bad. If you're Asian, you're worse than bad. All I right, thank you, Mr. M. That thank that was you. Three no, no, it was exactly three minutes. Exactly three minutes. Thank you, Mr. M. <laughs> Why watch in? To be heard by, to be followed by Teresa Jordan and Hightow Lee. Hi, I'm Wei Wa Chen. I'm the president of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Greater New York. And I'd like to say that there have been a lot of uh, things that have been tossed around today, and I'm not going to go and repeat a lot of it because it's really late. Um, first of all, the people who find all these reasons to say that the test doesn't work, well, come on. The test is in the proof, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the test. Because if the schools were bad, okay, we wouldn't have this discussion. You know, the test is obviously creating a pool of kids that are generating good schools. Okay. Now, setting that aside now, all of these little analyses and stuff like that, 
It, come on, again, you're not listening to the right people, or the people are just taking little, little nuggets that don't have to do with enough of what is true, okay? It misses the point. But furthermore, I want to say that if you listen to what we're t saying here, we say that there's a huge problem that there are not enough blacks and Hispanics that can get in, okay? There's a huge problem because the schools are really ridiculously bad in black and Hispanic neighborhoods. There is no excuse for that. And we really think, as a community, as Asian Americans here, we believe that we are all neighbors and must work to get all the schools better. And that means black and Hispanic neighborhoods deserve better schools and you should demand that. You should demand that and not let them get away with trying to say, let's go and mask this and just take away the test. You can't go and take away the test. I want to say also that it was incredibly racist to hear that Asians, Chinese cheat. Okay, I have never heard anything so racist. And you think that if we go to grades every day in class, that kids are not gonna go into a, a hungers game? Now, instead of having one or a couple of times a quote unquote high stakes test, you know, it's over with, it's done. That's okay. But if you have to think about every day you're gonna have to go and be a teacher's pet, or you have to go and uh, get some good recommendations from a, a, a teacher or an administrator or a principal, oh, that is nice. Or, or you see how many politicians' uh, kids land up in places that you are screened, right? And let's talk about numbers. If you think about numbers, okay, if you want to go screen schools, we already have a lot of screen schools, and most of them are much more female than male. So there's an imbalance. Boys are being punished by grades, okay? Look at LaGuardia this morning. They talked about LaGuardia and said, well, LaGuardia, well, I'll tell you, that's 75% female. Do we have a problem there? I don't think we have a problem there. You know, if the boys don't want to go and sing, that's okay. I understand it. You know, my sons didn't really want to sing that much. Okay? Thank so, you, Ms. Chen. Uh, thank you thank all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Teresa Jordan. <laughs> Teresa Jordan to be followed by Hai Tao Lee and Hang Chu. My name is Teresa Jordan. My granddaughter attends the New York Harbor School where students study agriculture, marine biology, marine policy and advocacy, marine systems technology, ocean engineering, professional diving, and vessel operation. Our students graduate and drive the ferries on the harbor. Our school students are growing oysters. There is no test for that school. We take the students at the level that they are and we bring them up to par. Our students, last year, they are, every year they're certified to work in these industries. Last year, 100% applied to college and 100% was accepted. No test, no test. I am horrified. I watch these young little kids stand up here and talk about this test, this one factor to get them into what they think is going to be the best thing for them. When Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they don't rely on one factor for admissions. Why should we? Don't, how many of the, what if those children, not all of them are going to be accepted. What happens if they miss the test by one point, two points, three points? Look at the pressure you're putting on these children. Thank God they go to school in New York City where they can graduate high school with an associate's degree. Why are you doing this to your children? You need to support, put more money in schools like Harbor, where they take children as they are and 
bring them up to par. Your kids are going to go to a school where they're isolated from all the other populations in the city. When they go to work, are they going to still be in that bubble? Is that what you want for your children? They have to learn to get along and be educated and work with all children, the smart ones and the ones that are not so smart, because that's the world we live in today. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Hightow, yes. Hightow Lee, get ready. Young people from this Harbor School, those young people, Harbor High School that we talk, that she's talking about, are also accepted into SUNY Maritime, which is one of the premier maritime institutions in the world. So just so you know, that's what we have going here. Thank you. Hi, Tao Li. Okay, Get so ready on deck, Hen Chu and Cho Lian. Thank you for staying late. Um, uh, this is the first time I came to a public hearing. This is the first time I speak in public about uh, my opinions, but it has been quite experiences. And I have learned a lot today. Uh, one thing I learned, we actually share a lot in common. I see parents of you know, Chinese, uh, African-Americans, and white, and Jewish. We all care about children's uh, future. We all ca care about equality in the society, and we are all fight against racism. So I don't know what your definition of equality is, but my definition, I think, is, I, that's what I'm teaching my kids is, is what Dr. Martin Luther King said. One day, in a day, he dreamed that our kids, our children, will not be judged by the color of their skin, yeah. but by the character, content of their character. Yeah. And we should strive for that, right? We should strive for it. We are not, I don't think we're in this society where we reach that yet. And SHSET is not perfect, but it's the closest thing to that standard. It's colorblind. It doesn't care where you live. It doesn't care you're rich or poor. It cares about you whether you put enough time to study. Right? And that's why we should, we are united in this fight. And the, the, the test is not the problem. It's a tool. It's just like a doctor's tool. It shows where the cancer is. The problem is this administration, the mayor, failed to deliver quality education, especially to the African and the Latino community. We should unite. We should unite to fight this fight, to hold them accountable to deliver quality education to their underrepresented Latino and African American societies. <laughs> By removing this test, it, it's detrimental. It's especially detrimental to the African American community. Even though a lot of Asians testified it's, it's, it's unfair. It's even unfair to the African American community because now it's under the spotlight. They are underserved. By removing this test, this issue is hidden. No one gonna notice it. This is a diversion from the mayor. Don't be tricked. Don't be played as pawns, OK? We need to unite on this issue. Hold the mayor accountable to deliver quality allocation to all races, regardless of color. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. All right, Heng Chu, you're up. Followed by uh, Leon Cho, or Cho Leon, and uh, Horace Walcott. Thank you. Oh, Leon Cho. Good evening. Um, I am a teacher. Um, I am also a parent of two boys. Uh, I teach at uh, FDR High School in Brooklyn. I support diversity in specialized high school, but it has to be through a fair and I'm biased admission process based on objective assessments. The test, the SHSAT, is an objective assessment to all students regardless of who they are. It does not make sense to exclude it or to cancel it from the admission criteria. Every student can succeed in school given enough effort, family support, and school support. 
from their early age on. My colleague, Ms. Elliot, and I both have been teaching new immigrant students for many years. In the last 10 years, on average, my Chinese bilingual biology living environment classes usually have a, on average, a 95% attendance. 95% of the students, they hand in their homework on time. And each year, about 95% of students pass the living environment regions. My colleague, Ms. Elias, Spanish bilingual living environment classes have usually a 90% of attendance. 90% of students in, his, in her class hand in the homework on time. And every year, about 90% of uh, her students pass the living environment region. Both Latina and Chinese students in our classes, they did well simply because they have been working hard, they have been disciplined, and their parents spend probably more time to support them at home. If we can do it at FDR, we can do it in any school in the city. Diversity makes our community and our country strong. I support diversity in specialized high school. However, I do not think it's right to blame the test for lacking diversity in these schools. Since this test was first used in the 1970s, there were years that there were, these schools were much more diverse than now. And we should all wonder what the true reasons are and find the real solutions to them. Thank you, Mr. Cho. Thank, Thank you. you. Horace Walcott. Horace Walcott. Thank you, Mr. Walcott. To be followed by Glenn Lee and Yuran Deng. Uh, the distinguished panelists, the parents, and the students, good evening. I'm a teacher at Brooklyn Technical <coughs> High School and I've been teaching at Brooklyn Technical High School for more than a decade. I would say that there is a clear and, pres and present danger to the working class of New York City, to the uh, poor class of New York City, and to the disadvantaged class of New York City if the specialized high school test is eliminated. And the reason why I say that is because there is an invisible Trojan horse that will be let in once the test is eliminated. And that invisible Trojan, Trojan horse is, are the forces that will trample and stifle the upward mobility of the lower class getting to the upper class and gaining economic and political empowerment. The mayor, and yes, he's my boss, <laughs> the mayor, oh sure, I'm careful, <laughs> but I'm careful. But I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to speak my mind. Let him speak his mind, please. This issue of this issue of limiting the upward mobility of the disadvantaged did not start with the mayor. It started with an essay 40 years ago by a jurist upper-class jurists who felt that the upward mobility of the middle class and the working class and the poor people by a high-quality education would take away from their pockets. And so the mayor is dancing to that tune, and the people of New York 
should stop him in his tracks. Yeah. I support elitism because it's got its benefits. The people who change the world are the people who are, who are given that opportunity to let their genius grow. I personally am one of the teachers who train those students who will become the future Nobel laureates because we have a special research program at Brooklyn Technical High School just for that. And when the mayor wants to get rid of the specialized high school test, he's going to disallow the incubation of genius that New York City has been famous for. Thank you, Mr. Walcott. Thank you. Glenn Lee. Glenn Lee. Come on up, Glenn Lee. You guys aren't helping. You're not helping. To be followed by Yuran Deng and Deirdre Wilkins. Yuran Deng and Deirdre Wilkins. Uh, I want to say that we have been asked by our hosts to vacate by 9 p.m., which is in 12 minutes. So we're going to hear, we're going to have enough time to hear everybody, but start packing your things up. Please, Glenn Lee. Thank you, uh, you Senator, uh, legislators. Um, I was a last minute, uh, so I'm going to make it really quick if I can. Uh, my name is Glenn Lee. I'm uh, alum, alumni of uh, Brooklyn Technical High School, class of 74. Uh, I grew up around uh, Chinatown in Lower East Side, and I'm a product of the public school system. Now, um, I'm supportive of, of, the, of the, the SH, uh, SAT, but I believe it should be tweaked out a little bit because I think the times have changed. But to tell you a little bit about myself, I came from a background. Um, I had a, a learning disability. Um, I was abused uh, as a child. And um, I was left back in school. And, um, and my guidance counselor did not feel that I was a good candidate and going to take this test. And I took the test and I didn't make it because the score was not good enough. And I went back to my guidance counselor and, and, and she says, you didn't make it, but there's summer school. So I went to summer school in a hot, sweaty Brooklyn Tech and I barely made it but I made it. So I went on and I graduated and went to college. I worked in aerospace. I started a business. I went on. I became an inventor. And I had my invent in the invention there for stir frying at home so I can touch everyone around me so they can eat healthier with a perfect stir fry at home. And being an inventor is really tough, but I'm not gonna pitch my uh, product here, <laughs> but you can go to my website. But what, <laughs> but what I'm saying is I do support this program and, and, I, and I believe that perseverance, and I'm talking to young people out there it may not be this test, but you're gonna be going through many tests in your life, and it won't be the last test. So you're just gonna to have to persist like I persist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Lee. All right, you're on Dang to be followed by Deirdre Wilkins. Don't think we can thank enough um, the opportunities that we've been given to speak because just this morning, most of my friends were denied an opportunity to speak at the House Committee of Education. I'm going to talk about something pretty different um, tonight. I think what we sense in a lot of speeches tonight was fear. 
We fear what we don't know. We fear the schools outside of those eight because we've heard so many terrible things about them. I myself have heard from my own friends, Asian, African-American, Hispanic, who've gone on to become teachers in the system. Heard about how their students heckled them, how they feared of entering their classrooms. We've also heard of students afraid of entering their schools because of the metal detectors, because of the substances that flow down the halls. There's some hard truth that we have to deal with. Truth beyond just a test or any other aspects of any guards of segregation or numbers. We have to really think about what our students are going through in our schools. Is it working? For whom? For how long? How is it that some students get to excel? How is it that others are really being left behind? I was at that council on high schools meeting this Wednesday, which was more sparsely attended than tonight's meeting. When the chancellor walked out on the teacher of the year, of course, he had better things to do and higher priorities. But the teacher shared about how he learned after one whole year at his school that really caring about what's going on beyond school made a difference, that his students maybe actually showing up to class late just to catch his attention so he can care more about them. So really, we need to ask ourselves the hard questions. And another thing I really want to thank is that this whole debate is bringing out a lot of things that the city have been covering and we haven't really been discussing. One is really the importance of democracy the importance of being able to speak our minds and share ideas and listen to each other. But I was really disheartened at the city council hearing when the chancellor basically said that, yeah, we could have, should have, could have, you know, had more process, had more consultation, but we would not have changed the proposal that he put forward. So we have a chancellor who doesn't really believe in democracy. He thought that we were just gonna be silent and be bullied again as we have been in history. Thank you, Ms. That Tang. us is our of us. But this Thank time, you. we're not gonna go silently into the night. Thank you. Deirdre Wilkins. Deirdre Wilkins. To be followed by Dao Yin and Kamala Carmen. And please start packing your stuff. Deirdre Wilkins. Mm. Brevity Good. is the soul of wit. I'm trying. Let's Good be witty. Good evening to our panel and to all of our attendees. I, after everything I heard, I'm gonna just get off my script here. I am an African-American, American Indian, Irish person. I was born and raised on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I went to the public schools there. Um, I went to, uh, they found out in third grade I had a very high reading level, so they decided that they had enough kids from our school and the school across the way to put together an intellectually gifted program that we had for um, fourth and fifth grade in our primary school. And then we went to the SP, special pupil classes for when we went to the junior high school, the junior high school 22. And in 22, well actually in fourth grade, I tried to take the test to Hunter with my friend. We got tutored by somebody who had gotten into Hunter. We didn't do well in that exam. Um, but we still had heard about the other specialized schools, so we decided if we get a chance, we're gonna try to go there. We had another program in eighth grade that prepared us for the test. That started with like 45 kids, and we had about three months. By the time the program ended, it was just me and my friend left. Um, the, the, the kids just dropped out, dropped out back and forth. What reason? Hmm. Um, we took the test, we passed the test. Even at that time, if you failed by a few points, you could go to summer school, but we both got in, we didn't have to do that. I was the second woman in the history of the school to get a degree in aeronautical engineering in 1977. Um, I changed uh, directions. I became an artist. I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in, in City College, a Master's of Science in um, Brooklyn College, and I just retired a couple of years ago from teaching in the Department of Education. I think everything everybody said has some validity in here. We do have to have these specialized schools and the ability to take this test 
so that people who are not going to be overpressured and upset by it, that, that want to go on that path, have that opportunity. But if there, we also need to hear about other schools like this Harvard School. I've been in the DL, we had never heard of the Harvard School. So there's something going on where we're not even disseminating enough information about what high schools are available out there for our students so that if the test, test route is not their thing, that they could go to something else that is. And we definitely, they said when I was teaching at Midwood, and that was like 12, 13 years ago, that they were going to improve the education from pre, pre, from kindergarten up to eighth grade so that they would, people would come into high school with levels that were, were good and that we wouldn't have to get rid of the regents exams. And most of you probably know they're already trying, still talking about getting rid of the regents because they never did anything to improve the, the education in the lower lower grades for people in the in certain economic neighborhood. So there's a lot of stuff that we still need to fix, and we, we should be giving people counselors to figure out what they want to do in elementary school. Why are we waiting until they're in, in high school and then starting to talk about Thank that? Thank you, Ms. Wilkins. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mr. Da uh, Dao Yin, please come up. Followed by Kam Kamala, ha Kamala Harmon and Brandon Ho, and that will be it. Dao Yin, go ahead. Yes. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Senators. Thank you, Assembly members. Thank you, everybody coming. Um, I'm a parent. I was a college student. I, I'm sorry. I'm a, I was a college teacher in another country many, many years ago. I like the podium, but not tonight because it's the time to go to TGI. It's time to go to TGI, but we have to, we have to fight here the, for the whole NYC public school si system. Um, I noticed that at least the two, three times the chancellor and then the mayor came in this testimony. Did you ever notice Mr. Chancellor never ever listened? He never ever listened. He just uh, spoke. He said he's all spoke. So what? We can, we just cannot pay more than 350,000 to have a CEO of the nation's largest public school system. He's not a listen, he's a spoke promoter himself. I think, or we think, the chancellor's style is kind of ridiculous. As the mayor's plan is just make hard study student feel good. You just can't do that. You just can't do that. As we said before, just uh, we need to raise the bar, not lower the standard. SHSAT, not an issue. Okay. Before the mayor and the chancellor carry out the easy but the bad plan, do you ever see a group of people out there, they're protesting, they ask for, hey, give us 7% to the American Super Bowl. Did you ever see? A group of certain people, like the Asian people, protest and rally in the testimony say, hey, give a 7% to the Hollywood A-list actors, actress. You didn't see that. So mayor and chancellor, they are not only politically wrong, they are logically wrong, they are totally wrong. If I, our voice can change this room, our voice can change the New York City public school system. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yen. All right. Kamala ha Carmen to be closed out by Brandon Ho. All right. Get your stuff ready, please. Hi, uh, my name's Kamala Carmen. I'm the parent of two children in New York City public school, high school. They identify as Asian, by the way. Asian people are not a monolith. Um, first, I want to say that I take it as a given that we must do more to integrate our schools. The schools in New York City are more segregated than the ones I attended in the 1970s in Louisiana. My mother, when she immigrated to this country, could not like eat at a whites-only lunch counter. But 10 years later, I, her daughter, could go to school with, where there were black and white children. And New York City's schools are actually less integrated than that. But merely integrating schools is not enough. The way we get to integration and how and what we teach our children when they are in school are crucial pieces of the puzzle. I'm a co-founder of NYC Opt Out, 
uh, which protests against high stakes testing. Um, currently, uh, s scores from state tests, and by the way, these tests, somebody else used the, uh, the, the metaphor of a thermometer. The thermometer is already broken. The state tests are broken, so you can't really use them as a reliable uh, metric uh, to measure proficiency. They are used to justify closing schools, privatizing them, and yes, segregating them when people say things like, we can't send our kid there, look at the test scores. What's more, pressure to do well on the narrow parameters of the state tests has narrowed instruction, and rote test prep has destroyed the love of learning. I would argue that that, and not cutting G&T programs, has tipped the makeup of schools like Brooklyn Tech. Our policymakers are focused on an achievement gap when what we have is an opportunity or access gap. Students are not similarly equipped, and yet we judge them and their schools and their teachers as if they were. So my first ask is that we do not use state test scores to rank schools or to determine who goes to what high school. My second ask is that when kids get to high school, that we do not subject them to test-based curriculum. Increasingly, elite private schools are eliminating AP because the courses tend to be broad but shallow, with the ultimate goal being coverage to ensure passing the AP exam. In an era when more and more colleges are test optional for admissions and many no longer grant um, college credit for AP courses, we should question this definition of advanced coursework. My children are lucky enough to attend a consortium school. The consortium schools eschew a test-based curriculum for one that meets children where they are and then goes deep, encouraging research, investigation, written reporting out, and oral defense. Instead of asking for more AP or more gifted and talented programs or more specialized high schools, we should be emulating the consortium model. Even controlling for race and class, students attending consortium schools graduate at higher rates than their other public school peers, are less likely to be suspended, and enter and persist in college at higher rates. For all the kids who spoke tonight who are worried that if they don't get to a special high school, they are somehow doomed to a bad high school or a bad job, listen to this. At this year's prestigious New York City Science and Engineering Fair, my children's school, where students take only one region exam and no AP courses, had more students per capita make it to the finals round than Bronx Science, Brooklyn Tech, or STI. Thank you, Ms. Carmen. The band just Thank won you very a much. award. So we can have schools that are integrated, but, but not, it's not a zero-sum game. Thank you very much, Ms. Carmen. Brendan Ho. All right, you are it. Close it out. Everybody get your stuff ready, please. We got to leave right away. OK. <clears throat> but Brandon, you get your full three minutes if you want it. All right. Hello, my name is Brandon. We have to keep the SAT. It will determine the best from the rest. Each, each New York City middle school is different in terms of quality of education. The SAT is fair and not biased to anyone in particular. Our educational system is based on meritocracy. If we get rid of the SAT and pick the top, ten, the top percent for each school, then that is not meritocracy. In addition, students will be stressing about one point of their grade in middle school to get into a specialized high school. I was not the top percent for my middle school. I, <clears throat> however, I studied hard and earned my spot in the specialized high school, Brooklyn Tech. <clears throat> And people who graduate from Brooklyn Tech also, she also done great things. For example, Leonor, <clears throat> Leonor uh, Regio, the founder of Balls and Noble, graduated from Brooklyn Tech. <clears throat> I once again say that the SAT is not is fair and not biased to anyone in particular. My recommendation is to increase the funding on the quality of education from K to eight. For <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I will tell you a little story about myself. In second grade, I was discriminated from people from all races, Hispanics, African American, Jewish, and my own race, Asians. But the most important thing, I, I went to my school to, for help, but they did not help me. Instead, they tried to degrade me, tried to lower my score, tried to help me back. Is that not corruption? What is? So. <clears throat> My another recommendation is to in <clears throat> offer local SASAT test prep to middle income family. <clears throat> in addition, expand the specialized high school. 2% of the New York City students are in specialized high school. Why restrict to eight? 
<clears throat> we want everyone to be the best, all right? As the slogan go, fix the K, fix K to A, and keep the SASAT. Thank you, Brandon. All right. Thank you to everybody who stayed to the very, very end. We want to thank NYU Tandon for being gracious hosts. We are sorry we went over the allotted time. I want to thank Senator Montgomery for hosting us in her district. And Senator Parsad, Assembly, Assembly Member Joanne Simon, 